having a good, good time, good hmm? time with nice. family. That is very important. Hmm. Okay. Reconnect with family. Co Corona is making all children go and connect with their family. <laughs> yes. So take yes. care and okay, uh, Good afternoon, Professor Bhatt, nice to see you. Hello. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining. Hi, how are you? Fine, thank you. Sorry, Dr. Sada, for some reason, I think I had two or three connections, so it wasn't clear. Um, okay, 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 okay. Yeah. No problem. And <laughs> That's why so, we need all Saturday so that we can stick to the you know, program without confusion. So maybe... Anyway, so Perry, uh, shall we start? I'll give a brief introduction about you. Yes, please, you can go ahead. Um, I just keep the video off for a second because the, the connection wasn't very stable. Yes. So I want to see how it goes. Okay, so let me start. Sorry for the, some disturbance here. Uh, <clears throat> today, the topic is about, you know, the migration. Uh, one minute. Types and characteristics of the migration, especially covering the international migration only, but uh, types and characteristics can be any other form of migration also. And the speaker is Paddy. And Paddy is familiar to all of you now. There is no need to give a elaborate introduction about Paddy. And she has been working on migration governance for a long time and in several continents, starting from Africa to Asia. And in, within this country, she has worked in several countries. And she has worked with several top organizations such as IOM and many other organizations. She graduated from London School of Economics. And uh, uh, Paddy is very much familiar with JRFDT now and uh, spearheading so many our webinars and other activities. So without much introduction about Paddy, which you, you, know, you know already, so I um, pass it to Paddy to start her lecture. Ready? Sorry, I was mute. I was mute. Okay, Dr. Dr. Sada, Dr. Sada, thank you very much for that introduction. I think I'm very humbled, uh, as I say, in uh, every forum that we have on the globe, on you know, under the the Global Research Forum, whether we're collaborating with others or we're we're sitting just by ourselves. Uh, by the strength uh, of this group, um, this research group, this group of scholars, experts, you know, bringing together their knowledge, bringing together their experience, uh, and seeing how we can better shape um, migration, the migration agenda in our small way. Um, we are a small part of the globe, but, uh, you know, size is not a, a determinant. I think the power that comes from within is a determinant, and some very interesting um, engagements have happened on this forum. So I'm very delighted and pleased 
pleased. Um, and I also have to confess that in the beginning when I came on, I was always being introduced as a professor or a doctor because I feel like I am among very distinguished people. And yet myself, I'm neither a doctor nor a, a professor, uh, but you know, aiming to be one and, and, and very much motivated, um, even looking into the room uh, of who, who is here with us. So I'm very humbled. And therefore my presentation this afternoon uh, will not probably sound like your typical lecture in the classroom. Uh, and hopefully during the Q&A, my, my connection will stabilize and then we can be able to engage and you'll be able to see me. But for now, I think if, um, if I am allowed, I will go ahead and uh, share my screen so we can go straight into it. Let me see. Do you see my screen? Uh, I can see it. You can enlarge. Can I enlarge? Or oh, did I? How did it go? Can you see it now? Yes, it's properly. Okay. Uh, I'm just, I'm also. I want to make sure that I can uh, keep, let me see. If I do this, that what does it do? It's <laughs> that so, so many, so many slides. It gives you all the screens. Yeah. So this is the, this is what I've been uh, trying to avoid. And I don't know, I don't really know now how to. Okay. Now it is okay. How is it now? Okay. Perfect. Very good. All right. So let's see. Oh, what does it do? You get something else. Oh, no. Now it's uh, typing everything I'm saying. No, that is not a problem, but you, you just pick. The screen is okay. Uh-huh. So it should show, okay. Hmm. Uh, show presenter view. How does that look? No, wrong. I think this is okay. You just... Can you see? Hmm. Yes. All right. Okay, so as, uh, as Dr. Sada has explained, this uh, this this discussion this afternoon, uh, and I, I'm, I'm careful to call it a discussion because that's why I'm hoping we can get into into the Q and A. I've sort of structured it in a way that I'm giving an introduction to Unit Four uh, of the types and characteristics of migration. Um, uh, other other uh, speakers that have come before me have already touched on to different uh, aspects, so I think I will not re try and repeat, uh, or I will make reference to to what um, our other colleagues have done. And as you know, it's all part of the, you know, the Global Compact on Migration Certificate Program that is being co-run by three um, organizations, including the Migrants Forum in Asia, uh, CSUN, uh, as well as the Civil Society um, uh, a Network that looks at migration. So um, without much further ado, I thought, first of all, it would be good for us to know who is here with us. Uh, these days, you know, we're not walking into lectures or conference rooms, and so we didn't even manage to, to greet each other. So I will ask Dr. Sada to just put in the poll, um, uh, and, and, and we just try to get a sense of who is here with us. Um, and you can see, I, I can just give an intro as that is coming in. You, you can see a poll that's coming on. I think for us, what's important is just to understand a bit. It gives, it gives a sense of, you know, who, um, you know, in terms of the migration information that you have or the migration background that you have or the migration knowledge that you, um, that you possess and you hold. So it would be, it, it would be interesting to just hear um, and then we can give, uh, we can give some results. So uh, I would just ask uh, those who are in the room with us to just quickly, I see it's filling up. That's good. We have a lot of students. I see the scholars are overtaking the students uh, a bit. Uh, um, and uh, glad to see we also have regional representative. We have representation also from civil society organizations. And it's also good to see that we have people who just have a general interest uh, on migration. Uh, and, um, and we would just allow it for maybe a few more minutes to, uh, to go. And I, I will talk over as we are, as the polls are coming in, we are 69 people in the room. Uh, and I think we are nearly um, reaching a quorum up to halfway very soon, I hope, or if we can get 45 if we can get um we can get more than uh uh you know three quarters of, of the people in the room that would be great to know um 
And the reason why sometimes we would like to know these kind of questions is because we want to know who we are speaking with. Uh, and also, as we will come to the end of the, the, the session, when we do the discussions, it's also it's always very good that our, our um, interaction is, is very inclusive, uh, that we are also, as a presenter, it also guides me in terms of, you know, the use of abbreviations and terms uh, and things that maybe people in the migration world may be, may be much used to. So the poll is closed and it seems we have have a lot uh, of uh, academic um, and scholar participation, um, as well as uh, as well as uh, students. Uh, but I think we have a good representation. You know, uh, maybe we just miss somebody from the United Nations side, but that could also concurrently run with a regional organization, depending on where people are based. So that's good. Thank you for that. Uh, we can can I stop sharing the results to continue? Yes. Okay, we can share the results and I think you'll be able to see the results there. If I say stop share, does it take me? Dr. Sada, how can we remove it? I just close it, I guess. Yeah. I just close it. Okay. All right. All right. So having understood who is here, I thought then it's um it's it's you know it's good to move then directly into understanding um you know the concepts that we that that we have um so in terms of of concepts um you know what is migration and people would ask who is a migrant and um I, I had a look at you know different 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 elements there. I tried to look at how it a migrant is described uh, um, according to sort of the theoretic un, um, underlying principles that 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 we have in the space of migration studies. Uh, I also got a lot of inspiration understanding the presentation that was done last week by Dr. Sada, who really went into diving uh, into the differences between the migrant and diaspora. Um, but then I I thought you know we could call it I guess around these two. Two, two types of definition. So we know that migration means the movement of persons away from their place of residence. So whether they are crossing an international border or they are staying within the state, um, within the, their country, uh, as long as they are moving away uh, from the place that they would usually call uh, their residence or their home, uh, that then we would consider, that movement would be considered migration. Uh, and that's according to the International Organization for Migration. But it's not a definition that's just closed in, uh, in that case because there is no agreed definition. But if we just try to look a little bit into what that means, uh, I think we can we can sort of look at it around two ways. You have one uh, type of, um, of of categorization, if we can call it, that looks at migration as being inclusive. So the definition is very inclusive. It includes uh, refugees as a subcategory in the migrant population, and we will explain a bit more as we go along why that um, where that is important um, uh, in, in in those definitions. And uh, in my reading, I found Solomon and Sheldon as uh, different articles that they have written to sort of try to coin around inclusion of of, of refugees or the non-inclusion of refugees in migrant populations and what that sort of means uh, in. In, in particular contexts. So, you know, in that case, then a migrant would be a person who moves away from their usual place of residence uh, and, and whether they are going temporarily or permanently and for a variety of reasons. So that brings in the concept of reasons behind the migration. And we know uh, that, for instance, refugees would be moving for different motivations than other categories. And they are seen um, to be a special group of migrants in this inclusive, des in, in this inclu uh, inclusive um, definition. And the picture that you have there is actually adapted from a World Migration Report um, that really tries to bring in and show, you know, uh, you know, the whole group of migrants, regardless of what the motivations would be, regardless of their length of stay, um, their, their, uh, what has driven them to, to migrate, um, uh, but, but refugees particularly being included in this pocket. And we will see a little bit later why that seemed to have been important. Then there is the other way that uh, Carling um, alludes to, which sort of uh, separates refugees uh, from, from the group of migrants. And even here, there's a particular setting in which, uh, in the, in which this phenomenon has been brought in, but we can also see its application, the application of this theoretical undertone in the way, for instance, the UNHCR describes a refugee. So the UNHCR describes a refugee as a person who's living outside their country of residence or where they are usually staying, and that they have, you know, 
but but this motivation to move is because there has been a well-founded fear of being persecuted and that's that's very important and there could be different reasons why they they see this this sense of persecution it could be related to their religion their race their nationality uh, the fact the fact that they may be a member of a particular social group against another and, and this particular and, and the, this could also go as well as you know having a difference in political opinion uh, and therefore they first a certain type of persecution that um that puts their life in danger and so so um, um, uh, forces them in this way to move, um, uh, and 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 in that case they are leaving, particularly because they are looking for protection from for themselves uh, from their country. So the country cannot provide enough protection, uh, and therefore they are they are they are they they make the move. Uh, and in this definition of residual, in, th in this residual way of looking at mi migration, it then says that we need to distinctively look at refugees. Uh, uh, as a different, as as not the same as migrants, because migrants may have different motivations. Migrants may not be in a position where they're really fearing for their life, uh, even though this concept of fear of life, this concept of um, uh, the extent to which my life is disturbed to the fact that I can I can call it a motivation that I feel there's there's enough persecution. Uh, I think there are concepts that uh, some scholars are also looking at in terms of can 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 the fact that I don't have access to a livelihood uh, really lead to personal persecution uh, in that case? And and therefore there are these kind of arguments that come out from different scholars. Uh, and so it's but but in this in this way of looking at migration, you're saying refugees have a different type. So regardless uh, of, of 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 what motivation might Migrants in general may have, refugees have a different one, and therefore even when we're dealing with refugees, we need to look at them with a completely different lens and a completely different picture in terms of addressing their vulnerabilities, and this we will look at in a minute. So. Uh, there's another, uh, the UN General Assembly, when they had met out in 2018, sort of looking uh, at, at, and this was very much related to the Global Compact for Migration and the Global Compact on Refugees, a lot of discussions going on around this and saying, should they be one compact? Uh, because you have had the longstanding argument, obviously, as it has gone, where you have migrants and refugees in some, uh, in some settings really being mixed up um, and in some settings being very distinct. Uh, and therefore, it was commonly looked at that these two groups, they were distinct and they needed to be separated even at the level of a legal framework. Uh, and it was also made very clear that refugees are entitled then to specific international protection. Uh, and that protection then is, you know, is already defined by international refugee law. And in this case, uh, it's reference to the 1951 uh, Refugee Convention and, and the protocols that followed on in 1967 and all the other type of provisions that go with it. Um, um, so that that seemed to be very important. And, and, and then here then sits how separating refugees from migrants becomes very important. And I thought it's important for us to coin on this because if we look, and I took an example there of the International Convention on Protection of the Rights of All Migrant Workers and Members of Their Families. Now, in, in this particular convention, um, which some, some scholars have also you know, written on and have sort of argued that it didn't really, uh, it, I mean, it, by comparison, maybe it's not a, it's, it's not a good comparison for, 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 uh, for sort of the, the argument against migrants and, and, and refugees or, or for what it covers. But I think it's in this way, it was very important in the way that it excluded very explicitly refugees from its definition. So when it talks about migrant workers and members of their family, it did not include refugees. And what does this simply mean? This simply means that it doesn't look at refugees who then become migrant workers and the members of their family as having uh, been uh, covered under this convention in another way. And I think what it alluded to was the fact that refugees had a different type of protection that was already provided to them. And therefore you needed one that was very much specific looking at all migrant workers. I mean, all in the sense of in inverted commas, all migrant workers that had not been ex that don't have the same rights that they would have. I think in some countries, uh, you know, some refugees would have the right to to work, for instance, as long as maybe they can get a work permit, they could be allowed to get a work permit. Uh, and in some countries, this is absolutely not allowed. Refugees cannot have access to 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 work. Uh, and in other countries, they've seen this as being very important in in how how refugees. Um, uh, contribute to 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 economic development, but uh, but also to their own livelihoods and how that uh, becomes very important. Uh, but this particular convention, um, though it hasn't been ratified by many by many countries, and I think there's a there's a bit of controversy between this convention and some of the conventions that have gone with ILO. For instance, the ones with ILO 
looking for the same type of rights for migrant workers, the ones for ILO would include refugees. So it's, it's, it's quite interesting to also see how then the definitions come to sit within international conventions, whether separately or together. And we will, we will get to see in a minute how we, you know, how in the recent, um, in the recent uh, world or in the recent space of international frameworks, uh, these kind of differences have been somehow reconciled, even though not enough. Um, then we move on to uh, looking at the types of migration. Now, I, I, you know, I, I got thinking, I mean, you can have, and, and you know, scholars can, can, we can, we can differentiate this space in migration in many different ways. Uh, if we look at it from a geographical or spatial basis, migration can, we can look at the flows in terms of where people are. So where am I when the migration starts? So because we also need to understand that migration has a starting point uh, and an end point, even though there are some scholars and especially those who are doing a lot of work around diaspora, they would say maybe your migration journey never really ends, right? Uh, because it can also have that it's a full cycle that goes all the way back to return to where you have been. Uh, and then maybe that's where it ends, but maybe actually it doesn't really end. So how how then would we be able to talk about this sort of types of migration, right? Um, looking at it that the journey begins somewhere, uh, you know, I leave my home, I move to X place, uh, maybe I stay there temporarily, which is also known as transit migration. Uh, I arrive in a certain destination, regardless of how long I stay, I, I and regardless of the motivations that I have, and then Uh, so in this in this way of looking at it as a cycle, maybe it's best that we look at it from a geographical point of view. Um, Dr. Sada, I see a, a point that my internet is not stable. So just give me a beacon if uh, it's not clear or you cannot you cannot see me. Um, so then talking about geographical, so we can split it in two, three ways. We can split it in looking at it in terms of migration uh, from, from an internal, uh, meaning country uh, movement. So the territory being a country or a territory, because we also do have, um, uh, you know, um, geographical or should we say jurisdictions that are, that are not, that may not be for one, for one reason or another, and other pol political considerations or another, look at migration, uh, look at a, a country space, but a territory, um, and uh, and therefore the movement within that particular territory. So I think here I should have added, instead of just country, territory becomes very important. Um, so, and, and, and here I'm talking about politically jurisdicted territories. So I think that's that's very important to say. So I wouldn't be talking about migration uh, sort of within a particular province of a country, but I would be talking about, uh, for instance, countries that, uh, you know, for one reason or, on, or another, uh, see that, that other element, uh, extension of it as being a territory. Um, uh, as that... <clears throat> As an example, uh, you know, not many countries, for instance, coming to a country, uh, for instance, such as uh, Kosovo, uh, a number of countries have recognized Kosovo as a country and still others have not recognized it. And therefore, but we cannot ignore the fact that when people move out of Kosovo to another region, whether it's within the Balkans, uh, it's into Europe, to the United States or elsewhere, that they are actually moving, uh, that, that this is also, this would also be termed uh, um, a migratory movement, and we will see that obviously in, in 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 its context. So, if it's within Kosovo, we would still say that it's internal movement. If it's it's if it's if it's uh, crossing to within the region in the Balkans, we would say it's in, intra-regional. Europe, we would still say it's intra-regional, international. Um, we would we would sort of expand it a bit, and there are some blurry lines sometimes between the intra-regional and the international. So, let's just zero in a bit on internal migration. I I thought that was important to bring it as as an example. Now. Movement from people from one defined area to another. I think we're all very familiar with rural urban um, migration. Um, there is also a lot of urban rural migration in, in, in some countries where you see a movement. Uh, and particularly this has also been, uh, I think, uh, being predicted as, as what would become a trend in the future, looking at uh, how COVID has impacted um, economies and particularly how it has impacted on resources for cities uh, and jobs for cities, but also how the move towards um, 
uh, decentralization in, 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 in many countries is going and moving some of the resources to the rural areas. And therefore that this could have some impact on return migration. So people who previously moved to urban centers are now moving back to rural areas or because of incentives that are related to national programs that are particularly looking at, for instance, you know, agro-processing or, you know, uh, um, that look at also, for instance, um, other activities, for instance, in the area of uh, infrastructure development or in areas such as mining, where mining areas may not be predominantly uh, linked to urban centers, but they may be in rural areas um, and other kind of uh, economic earning activities that would lead people to move from an urban center to a rural center. Uh, examples of rural, rural migration are also existing. And I mean, for instance, in parts of, of Southern Africa, this is also quite prevalent. I, I can just zero you in on a country. Um, Zimbabwe, very well known for tobacco farming uh, and a lot of seasonal work moving within Zimbabwe itself, where even um, migrants are moving from north to south or south to north, uh, depending on, on, on where they can find, um, you know, um, uh, uh, tobacco tobacco farms and, and where they predominantly are. Actually, it would be northeast, uh, mainly it's sort of this northeast and, and a little bit to the south, but migrants could be coming from around. Malawi is also another where you have seasonal work, um, people moving, uh, large numbers of people where they move um, are predominantly for work, some that say temporal and some that move uh, in the long term. So that rural rural is also something that's that, that's quite um, uh, a distinct measure of internal migration. So though all this would be happening within a country or within a territory um, and driven by various drivers. Interregional migration, this is where a border is actually crossed. So we're talking about a national border or a territorial border, uh, like I had explained before. So where a person moves from one country to another, um, uh, and and here, uh, uh, of course, uh, I, I put the, the chart there that tries to show uh, intra-regional movement within uh, the African um, the African continent, and you can see how very uh, intense and interesting it is. Um, uh, I think it's 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 becoming common known statistics that a lot of movement actually uh, and researchers are bringing out more and more information and showing that there's a lot of movement within the African continent itself, just zeroing in there on the right side, uh, bottom right side, where it says West Africa, where you have a red patch, there is also a large concentration of people moving uh, from, from within. And you can see from where the red almost forms like a, I would say almost forms like a, a rainbow. So you can see the shapes and the, the graph is meant to sort of show the flow of the colors is meant to show the direction, uh, if, if, if one may say the direction of the flow. And you can see that a lot of movement within the continent itself, uh, typical examples, migrants moving from Sierra Leone going to the Gambia. So here it's not even looking at the economic status of that particular country, but looking at the availability of jobs at the opening up of the sector. Gambia is very important for tourism. Some of the movement is very seasonal. So it's very much related to what the European holiday timeline is like. And Gambia, the Gambia is, is a very interesting um, uh, country for, uh, for, for tourism, relies heavily on tourism and therefore migration of, 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 of workers, so those who are going to service the tourism industry would be seen predominantly uh, during uh, peak times of, of, but then some are also staying to take on other odd jobs in, in the informal sector uh, to supplement the work that they do. So a lot of movement within the region itself. Some of the movement being obviously, um, and then we will talk about it as we go looking at it, you know, how is it really being facilitated? Is it, is it, is it regular? Is it irregular? Uh, and others use the terms, is it legal or illegal? And we will get to understand that a bit more as we go on. Um, then looking for, looking for instance, if you look at North Africa there, uh, North Africa obviously uh, is showing a big green line that goes to the outside of Africa. So probably not a, would not give us a very good example, but we could understand what uh, international migration looks like from there. So maybe let me zero in a bit into East Africa. East Africa, if you look at it, that's on the right, on the left side top, uh, blue and it's you, you see a lot of inflows also into the region so people moving from Kenya to Tanzania um, uh, and particularly this would be cross-border movements for work uh, in, in various different sectors. Another thing that facilitates intra-regional movement, you would say, is the free is the is the protocols on 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 in the free the, the protocols on the free movement of persons. Uh, um, 
Africa is predominantly becoming uh, that continent that would like people to move freely. Uh, so I come from Zambia. Should I, you know, should I desire or find an opportunity to work, for instance, in Ethiopia? Um, the, 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 there should be a, you know, there should be a protocol that is agreed at the regional level that allows me to make uh, those kind of movements um, and, and, and encourages uh, that kind of movement in terms of filling up uh, uh, the labor market in, in in that particular country. So a lot of countries um, in, the, in the African region belong to a regional organization or some kind of regional economic mechanism that has a, um, a, a protocol on free movement of persons attached to it. Obviously, sometimes not very easy to understand for all levels of skills, uh, but that's also, it's important that these things happen. I think we can also see clear lines, uh, even though you don't have a graph there that shows movements um, Within, for instance, uh, the the Southeast Asian uh, countries, uh, a lot of movement, intra-regional movement, so cross-border migration that goes from, for instance, uh, from um, India, Sri Lanka, Thailand, Philippines, Indonesia, Bangladesh, uh, among others, heading to Malaysia for work, uh, or migrant workers that move from Indonesia and going to Thailand to work in the in the fishing industry. Um, and there could be several different types of examples of how people are moving within the region. So not really crossing those regional borders, but staying within the region um, for different motivations. So that's important that we're talking about a crossing of a national border or a territory. International migration, um, this is really transnational. Um, and here we're talking about moving away from the place of usual residence and you're going across an international border to another country. And here you are not a national of that country, um, uh, but you move uh, for, for various motivations, which we'll look at later. And I think the phenomenon of international migration is something that we are also very much aware of. It's something that we have been covering uh, quite widely in the uh, discussions we have been having as part of the Global Compact on Migration webinars. Um, and I think it was also very well explained last week and the weeks before. Um, I think I even remember the, the very first unit that we had with Dr. Raj, where we, where we, we were talking about sort of the evolution and the theoretical undertone to how we have gotten into international migration and motivations also being different. An example of the international migration there, you look at North Africa, so going back to our map, you look at the movement, the big green arrow that crosses from North Africa to go to the outside of Africa. Now, the importance of, of these definitions, uh, sometimes, uh, I mean, sometimes we think, is it that real? Is, is, is it really important? It's really important in terms of policymakers um, having to understand how people are moving, how people are being facilitated, but also how um, they can, how they can, um, how they can um, understand what kind of protection measures, what kind of vulnerabilities uh, different types of migrants would face according to, uh, you know, these these geographical considerations and these geographical movements. Coming to the to another way we can look at um, migration. I mean, we can also look at it in terms of the length of stay. So the time that is spent um, in this place that I'm not defining my home. So the time that is spent away from the place that I call my home uh, or my usual place of residence. So the short term migrants, so those who have changed their usual uh, uh, place of stay for less than three months, um, you know, you stay for at least three months, but you stay there less than a year. And this could also be looked at seasonal. And uh, then there's also long term migration um, where people, so if you change your place of residence for at least a year or more. Um, but uh, so, I was, I was reading up on Southeast Asia and trying to understand intra-regional migration. And actually, interestingly enough, UNESCO had done a publication which they called internal migration within Southeast Asia. So you can see how these terminologies also go across in terms of how you, uh, the position of where you put um, uh, different words, you know. So if you say internal migration within Southeast Asia, uh, then for me, it reads as intra-regional migration. So I guess, you know, uh, one would say it's, a, it's an issue of uh, the play of language. So according to this publication, they had sort of looked at short-term migrants or individuals, uh, short-term migrants as individuals who live away from their place of residence for employment reasons for a period of one to six months. And this particular one was looking at labor migration and that's why it points to employment reasons. And the reason why uh, I brought this out is because you can see that in, the def in, in, in some of the definitions, you would have 
you know, one saying at least three months, and another one such as this UNESCO publication that looked at labor migration within uh, Southeast Asia is pointing to a period of one to six months. And why do I bring this out? I bring this out because I think this concept of time is really very much relational. It's very much relational to what uh, the study is about, is very much relational to what uh, the data statistics are being collected for, is also very much uh, relational to um, to what uh, the, the, the goal is at the end of the day in terms of defining uh, these groups of migrants. Uh, so as you can see, it you know seasonal migration um, can really change. There are also people who talk about the movement, for instance, which I which I didn't include here, uh, sort of these bub these these bulging cities. So you would have cities um, you know, cities, let's say such as London. So the population of London during the week is much higher than the population of London you would have in the weekend. And in fact, others say you need to study it from Thursday because of the concept of flexible working and because of the concept of also of, of the fact that it's quite expensive to live in, you know, in a mega city like London. Uh, people have moved out in terms of their place of residence to live outside London, but they are coming in in the week to work, maybe there's a flexible working arrangement that gives somebody two days in a week. So the population, if you look at it, uh, and, and in some cases, in, in some studies, you've also looked at it as a concept of mobility, by the way, uh, looking at it as a bulging city. So it bulges and grows during the working hours, and then it shrinks back to its usual size in terms of the population of the people who call it home. So those who would have been living actually outside of London. Um, and I think this is actually very prevalent in other places. Nairobi would also be a, an interesting country, an interesting, interesting um, city to look at where uh, you know, it is a tradition, it, it, has become, it, it has been the tradition that people who live in Nairobi may not particularly come from Nairobi. So they come to, into Nairobi Monday to Friday to do their work, earn their money uh, through trade, informal trade, whatever it is, but their actual residence is outside of Nairobi. Uh, and, and by outside, I would mean that they would be actually also physically living there. So not just visiting their families and friends outside of the region, but physically living there and actually calling outside of the city as their usual place of residence. So in the next town, you would say. So then there is also this, this seasonality and what it also means. Uh, some scholars have argued that we should really be calling this mobility because it's really mobility for work, uh, mobility um, in terms of a, a, a sustaining our livelihoods, and you wouldn't really term it as migration uh, because uh, even, even, even if you look at it at the length of stay, it doesn't quite sit in the parameters. Anyway, something we can we can debate about in our in our session. Um, then the last maybe example, I was looking there at the United Nations recommendations on statistics of international migration, and they define an international migrant as a person who changed their country of user residence, and that they can either be short term or long term. So when they collect their data and statistics, they are very much um, uh, doing this disaggregation and being able to show the difference, but that we cannot say that one is, for instance, mobility, because for those who don't who say migration has to be more than one year would consider short-term migrants as mobility, uh, uh, which is quite distinctly different from migration. Um, let's move on. Why are people moving? Um, and I think this then would, this is what I sort of termed as the characteristics of migration, to try and understand a bit more what, why are people moving? Um, and, and here, others would call them drivers of migration. Um, I spell them out just as push and uh, pull and push factors. Um, uh, somebody had also said uh, in, an, in an article that I read, it said, you know, pull, push and tag, uh, because it, 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 really, it really depended on how you were facilitated. And that would probably be the, that, that's an, a topic for the next uh, slide. On this one, in trying to understand a uh, characteristic of migration, we can think about why people are moving. And, and I think here it's very important to say that even though, I mean, the, the list that, that I've put down to you there is not in any order of importance. Um, distinctively, labor migration um, is on the increase, has always been on the increase because, uh, you know, as, as, as the old adage says, you know, migration has been happening uh, since, uh, you know, since the, how would you say, since, um, so it, is, is an, it has been an important poverty alleviation strategy. So we move uh, to find work to improve our livelihoods. Uh, 
people move where they cannot, where they find that in their current location, they're not able to make ends meet. This has forced people to move. Uh, people have moved because their skill is fetched uh, much higher. And here I would bring in the concept of skill related migration. Um, I mean, you can, you can have examples, for instance, uh, quite a big movement that came from uh, driven by uh, an initiative of the German government looking for highly skilled migrants and particularly looking at for engineers uh, at some point where there was also a deliberate move so a, a certain type of visa that you could get uh, that allows you for that kind of movement so this high talent high talent kind of movement um, in many countries you still have a lot of these provisions that are there uh, in China you had what they used to call the 1000 talent program um, or oh, is it 10,000 talent program now? I, I, I cannot seem to, to place it very well. But you have a lot of talent programs that are at a national level and also at the provincial level that is calling for this international talent that comes in relation also to innovation uh, and industrialization. So that kind of labor, so high-skilled labor movement, whether they're also moving for um, low uh, Low, low skilled uh, migration or semi skilled, as others would call it, uh, a big drive and a push uh, for uh, domestic workers, for instance, this is what we have seen uh, very clearly and evidently and actually even much more organized uh, in places like um, uh, the GCC. Uh, um, by organized doesn't mean maybe that it's safe or orderly, but that there's a lot of, you know, government to government talks around organizing that kind of labor movement. Um, and that movement would also be seen, for instance, domestic workers moving to Hong Kong from the Philippines. Um, and that also labor migration has then allowed governments to uh, look, the more, the more people have moved out for work and are calling another country as the usual pl place of, of, of work, has made sending countries think about their citizens when they're abroad and has also increased the kind of work that they do in relation to consular services, but also the kind of protection measures that they would have when that particular work doesn't go right. So a lot of interesting aspects under labor migration. I think it's very difficult to unpack it here <laughs> uh, and just talking about as a characteristics, but I thought I would touch on that. Of course, a lot of movement also on the irregular side, but we will talk about that later. Um, China, as it was moving towards industrialization, a lot of movement, uh, the tigers of, uh, of Asia, as they moved on and transitioning their economies, they picked up a lot of labor. And that labor could have come from international internal flows, inter, intra-regional flows or international flows. Um, Malaysia attracted attracts all, all types of um, uh, skill types of labor, uh, as is evident from from the statistics that they have, and I don't think that there is any country in the world that they can that can say that they don't have labor migrants in their workforce. So essentially, the whole globe, uh, thinking about India uh, and how internal labor migration has particularly been very very important in the medical in the medical field, um, and actually also the labor migration, not just of nurses moving from rural areas to urban areas or from areas where there has been a lack of health, medical health professionals um, within, the, within the Indian context, but also labor migration um, out of India to places such as Africa, the United States, Europe, um, and you name it. Um, migration, for instance, um, that has um, that has uh, people have moved uh, Cuban doctors uh, could be found in, in parts of Africa uh, as well um, due to different co uh, corporations between the countries all because of a particular um, movement or flow. So labor migration, um, unpacking it, uh, like I said, would, would probably take us the whole of this webinar. Forced and displaced migration um, could be a reason why people have moved because of conflict and political turmoil. Um, like I explained in the definition itself, uh, particularly when we look at um, internally displaced persons, uh, these would be people who have been forced or they've been obliged um, to flee or to, you know, to leave their homes um, uh, because they need to avoid the effect of armed conflict or there's general violence. Uh, and actually in, in other places, there's also been, you know, natural or human made disasters. Um, and I'm, I'm picking these categories from the from the definitions that are that are given um, on internally displaced persons. Um, 
in ten, uh, here we can also look at asylum seekers, you know, and asylum seekers uh, are those people that that need uh, that seek international protection and actually need it, um, and therefore they can claim, uh, you know, they can make a claim that has not yet been finally decided on by the country which it has submitted, and that's why they are called asylum seekers, and they're they're a distinct group um, from refugees because that's the process they aim to get to, uh, so that eventually every recognized refugee was initially actually an asylum seeker, and this comes from uh, the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees definition. So that transition as well. So you, you have uh, quite a lot that are moving. You have people that are moving because they're refugees. Um, uh, so they're they are, they are living uh, in camps, but when they're in the camp in that particular country, we cannot consider them um, according to, you know, to, to those who would support the uh, the the exclusive the, um, the residual approach uh, in definition we cannot consider these to be migrants they need to be considered as refugees because they need different types of protection and different type of provision and and definitely so you can see that uh, happening in different spaces because the countries of which they are hosted sometimes may not be able to provide them all the protection measures that they need and therefore you need an international um, an internationally accepted uh, legal framework that covers refugees um, and asylum seekers in 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 this case. Um, then you know, so people could be moving, like we said, you know, for conflict or political turmoil. Um, uh, and people could also be moving because there's environmental and climate change. Uh, and here I talked about internally displaced persons, and I think this is where it fits actually even better as a, as a definition. And even though sometimes internally displaced persons can be within a country, um, so you are moving within that country, within that territory, by the way, for all the categories, uh, the characteristics of the push and pull factors can apply to the, to the, to the two, um, to the two types that we spoke to earlier, we spoke about earlier. So if you're looking at environment and climate change, what's really pushing people to move? Um, there's a lot of the, there's a new concept now of saying, should we call people climate refugees? Because if we call them climate refugees, then we can really provide for them, you know, the, the, the needs and understand the vulnerabilities that they have because people have essentially packed up their homes because of a, of a, of a, of a, of a crisis in terms of uh, climate change or that one which is related to environment. And, and here we, we, we think about, for instance, um, uh, a recent example I would give is, you know, 2019, where you had two heavy weather storms uh, that 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 really caused destruction in Malawi, Zambia, Zimbabwe, really moving families, um, not just from inside the country, but also some had to even cross borders for them to seek refuge. So the notion is also that, you know, here you would need to provide a different kind of support, uh, recognizing the kind of um, uh, risks or recognizing the, the kind of challenges rather that they, that these um, um, climate migrants uh, have have moved for. So there is a notion of should we really be calling them climate refugees, and there are some that are against and some that are others uh, that that are not because uh, they sort of see this, for instance, as being a temporal measure. You know, so why should you be called a climate refugee if that particular environmental uh, um, issue would be resolved at some point and you you can return to the land, whereas in the in the place of conflict, uh, people have not been able to return to the land, even though you know you've you've had countries that have actually moved and have become post-conflict. So there is all, there's all these notions um, that go around each of these uh, categories uh, of, of, of migrants. Um, uh, and then, you know, we talk about settlement. So those who move particularly for family reunification um, and, and, and this in this category, it could also include, uh, I should have actually included that those who move to a country because of naturalization, you know, I was born in a particular country um, and therefore I, I decide to settle there. So for permanent residence and for, for settlement, or I have part of my family members who are living in that particular territory or country. So I would, I would permanently move there and I settle there and begin my my home there uh, and I call this new place as my usual place of residence um, and this is usually seen in terms of the long-term perspective that's how it's sort of usually seen because it's settlement it's really settling not really for temporal even though the question is raised you know some people may only settle for as you know as as, as much time as it allows um, whatever uh, whatever push factor was happening so let's say that you know um, Argentinians uh, that are moving um, to Italy and trying to find their heritage linked to a particular legislation that allows them uh, some kind of natural 
decentralization according if you follow the, the the legal legislation that was that 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 allows this kind of naturalization is it because of the issues that are happening in argentina so is it a temporal settlement um so is it an option that is made to miss can i really call this settlement well i'm contributing to um to the general welfare of that particular society so temporal could be 10 years or temporal until I die there. Um, uh, these sort of become uh, very, uh, very important parameters that people look at in terms of settlement, but still very important as a pool factor um, uh, for, uh, for people to, to migrate, to decide that they're going to take their migration journey. Student mobility, and I put mobility there because um, I was going to say student migration. Um, yeah, student migration, probably a better, word, a better word to put there, but you know, students basically that are moving because of education, um, whether there is a, a factor of that receiving government providing um, better quality, uh, you know, better, better quality of education uh, or better opportunities in terms of the prospects that, that students would have that would not be available in their home, or just the fact that they can get an education. Um, and now, I, I, and the reason why I struggled between migration and mobility is because, you know, you do have cross-border communities. So these will be communities that are living side to side, right next to each other. And we're trying to ask ourselves and wonder how you know children are moving from one uh, from one um, county, so so sorry uh, cross border, so from one village to another because of these artificial boundaries that have been made. But they go to school actually in one region uh, instead of the other. Um, we've also heard of st student mobility, uh, you know. Students that move, for instance, from Tanzania, and they 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 move to Uganda. This is where they take their 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 their, their secondary education, their university. Students that move from one country to another, um, uh, India, a, a, a very large, uh, uh, you know, a, a country that's known to receive a large number of international students. Uh, but also internally, there's a lot of movements depending on you know the education opportunity that that you're looking for. Um, I remember having to talk to a friend, and I didn't even understand. That there was, you know, particular places you could go, which are like Silicon Valley, you know, and that's the one place you need to go if you want to really upgrade yourself in, in, in innovative technology and what the future prospects looks like in India. So also understanding what, uh, uh, you know, uh, these centers of excellence within countries can do in terms of pulling um, uh, students in. Um, some countries such as China, which predominantly offered university uh, education in, 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 in Mandarin, moving uh, moving towards English based uh, studies to attract the large number of students um, um, you know statistics for instance in Wuhan alone would show you that you have more than 4,000 international students who were there and some of these statistics were coming out because we saw you know in trying to understand what was the impact of COVID on migrants um, so you know understanding what that means uh, in terms of scholarship opportunities in Russia African students moving to Russia uh, to study economics to study medicine um, uh, you know, students that move, um, yeah, in many places, moving to Europe because of scholarship opportunities or different types of education that's their movement to the United States, uh, movement basically across. Uh, so, and this could be for short-term courses, and this is where mobility sort of comes in, but it could also be actually for long-term and therefore it qualifies in the, in the, in the sense of migration. So a very important uh, composition uh, of this moving and dynamic group of migrants, uh, the students, um, and at all of, and all different levels. Lifestyle migration, and here I think we're talking about high net worth uh, immigration. So, you know, knowing that our governments and countries are run by uh, visas, so we often have to look at, um, uh, you know, making sure we have the right visa. Uh, and understanding that, uh, and, and understanding that no, not all countries have access to, you know, not all passports. So rather, that's a better way to put it. No, not all passports uh, can give you free entry into a country. Um, some countries, as an income generating activity, had resorted to citizen and residence schemes, and it's a wide range of countries. Um, people would say this is particularly in the Pacific and the Caribbean, but you have examples of Canada that was running, um, you know, a residency scheme 
team um, in a partic in particular cities as well. Uh, Australia at some point I think had also also considered as a as a as a residence scheme in terms of trying to attract maybe not particularly high net worth, but it was also looking at high skilled uh, migration in this case. Uh, but you've had you have countries in in southern Europe, Greece, Cyprus, Malta, Portugal, um, are also countries that would run some you know some sort of citizenship and residency scheme. So basically you 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 pay into that system for you to get free entry into that country. Maybe you have to buy property or you have to invest a certain amount of money into that particular economy. And that gives you free entry in and out. And that also has meant that families of these migrants have been able to move. Uh, a lot of controversy around what this means. Um, and then some simply moving because there's better air, there's a better quality of air in, in this particular in this particular country. So movement, for instance, to Nordic countries from countries uh, from high net worth uh, immigrants come from sort of richer countries, if you like, that move because there's a better quality of education, or there's a better there's 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 no pollution. Um, the food is is much more organic, or whatever it would be. So those would be characteristics. Uh, moving on to characteristics, I thought it's important for us to touch on facilitation. I see we're already 47 minutes. The time really flies. And here I'm asking the question: Why are people moving? Uh, how are people moving? You know. Um, and the IOM has sort of two ways to talk about uh, flows of people moving. So you have regular migration, which would be occurring obviously in compliance with the law. So you look at what is the law of that country, origin, transit and destination, what does it say about movements and therefore that, that particular movement is happening in a much in, in, in accordance with the with the laws of that country. Um, and here you see more and more countries opening up, you know, pathways for skilled migration, pathways for education, um, pathways also for innovation. Um, more and more, the EU has a visa for uh, for for sort of a researcher visa, um, and and other countries and uh, are negotiating this. The EU and China have been in high negotiation on sort of a visa that allows innovators to move up and down. Um, um, the U.S. has even a visa category that allows this kind of innovative uh, way, uh, you know, innovate, in, innovation related type of visas and even also sometimes even attracting families and spouses that could come with. I mentioned the example of Germany um, in the earlier days, but even many more that are looking. These days, more and more with COVID, we see how the space is being opened up for medical professionals uh, into the European uh, into the European labor market and joining that labor force, or basically just expanding what is a foreign uh, what is predominantly a foreign based labor force, but also recognizing the you know the efforts that uh, that labor migrants have um, uh, in terms of these flows. So you know, creating much more and more space for this uh, this kind of migration. Uh, I mean, there are country there 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 are countries and and territories and spaces that have also realized that, uh, you know, it, what you would call maybe semi-skilled migration or low-skilled migration is still essentially very important. Agreements, for instance, um, when, you know, that looked at, you know, construction in, in construction work that you would have particular agreements between, you know, two countries. Um, movement, for instance, of a special type of skill. So, for instance, Chinese chefs um, having a special type of provision with the German government uh, agreed uh, in terms of what that process would be, vetting process, uh, to ensure that you have a uh, you know, a safe, uh, safe migration, and you have uh, regular pathways for chefs to be able to move into the German market and really trying to connect that supply chain. So these kind of um, movements, you know, Austria taking more um, care workers, uh, for instance, um, Thai, Thai nurses moving to the United States. Uh, these are just some of the examples where regular pathways are being uh, are being allowed in terms of, of, of people moving. So this would be happening more in your regular space. Uh, so in this case, usually you're moving with a passport, you are moving with uh, all the authorities quite aware of your movement, uh, you're moving with a passport or some kind of a documentation that allows you movement, you're crossing borders uh, with less vulnerability, one would say, with less vulnerability. Of course, you know, even regular migrants have their own type of vulnerabilities that they could experience and, and you know, things that, 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 that make their journeys um, different, uh, not always easy as well. Irregular migration, this is where we're looking at it, where it's taking place outside of the law. So really you are using, uh, so the, the very typical examples here, and we're talking about entry into that country or exit, you know, from your country of origin, uh, um, 
and here it's you know where you are we're talking about movements that have a human trafficking and modern slavery element to it um and and in talking about modern slavery you know here we it's it's really exploitative you know this this severe exploitation of of, of other people for personal and commercial gain um and then people are becoming trapped you know um and and their and their needs are actually not being provided for and they're basically being treated in a very in, inhumane way but that beginning of their journey to move may not may not particularly resemble um the vulnerabilities that they will experience a, a, along the journey uh, some knowing and some not knowing but it doesn't take the element element of exploitation away so these kind of movements you would consider them irregularly because usually you're not really crossing a border with knowledge full knowledge of your country or full knowledge of the country that you're entering into so these are the cases we're hearing of uh, young adolescents, children, women uh, being either on the boats that we see crossing the Mediterranean, whether it's on the central route or it's on the western, um, the central western routes or the central route where we're looking at movements that are happening uh, of trafficking of migrants into Europe in the backs of lorries, where we're looking at uh, people crossing rivers and you know rivers and national parks uh in in trying to you know to get to the other side for for one reason or another uh so the motivations like as i said would still be be able to apply but it's more here talking about how is the person moving how are they being facilitated to move smuggling of persons um a phenomenon that's that's very popular and i think i already alluded to it um uh, and, and in this way, you know, being used as a facilitator, knowing on unknown, knowing uh, truck drivers uh, putting passengers behind the back of their their trucks, their in their seats, and helping people cross borders, uh, and in, in one way or another, many ways that people could be smuggled into a country um, or into a, a particular territory. And in this in this uh, particular case, we also put refugees, asylum seekers, and IDPs, um, not because their movement would be taking place outside of that particular law, but because their movement is made difficult from when they're starting the journey. And maybe they're only really getting their um, identification or they're only really getting recognized by the law when they have reached the boundary on which they're going to declare their um uh, their need for international protection. So, uh, so also very important to know that these could be these could be engaged in the irregular movement up until they realize what rights are available to them. Um, Talking about those, you know, in, in looking at, you know, if, if we look at regular and irregular migration and facilitation, I think that the notion now has come is that we cannot really look at them as two separate processes. So, yes, in some cases, very two clear, distinct, and sometimes the world is really mixing a lot. Um, and 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 how is it how is it mixing? The IOM says that mixed migration flows is looking at the irregular nature of and the multiplicity of factors driving such movements and the differential needs and the profiles of the people involved. So here you're talking about complex population movements. So you have refugees, IDPs, economic migrants and other migrants, but you also have you know, minors, you have environmental migrants, smuggler, smuggled persons, victims of trafficking, all these really forming these mixed flows. And this is, this is, this is the facilitation or this is the mode in which people are moving. So UNHCR says, when we looked at when we look at mixed migration flows, we need to understand that we need to treat very. Uh, they needed to be, you know, the migrants are fundamentally different from refugees, and therefore we should treat them very differently under international law. Migrants, especially those who are moving for economic purposes, they move in order to improve their lives, but the refugees are being forced to move. Uh, and essentially, it's saying that you know migrants and refugees they are using the same routes, however different they are. They use the same transport, and they are using the same transit methods, and and sometimes even arriving to the same overseas destination. Right. So. We, it's, it's, it becomes a very difficult and blurry line and gray area for, for um, border, for border um, authorities to make that distinction between uh, those who are moving or, uh, for economic purposes and those who are moving for, um, um, for, for in terms of, you know, if it's forced migration related or if it's environmentally related or they're running away from conflict or they have been smuggled in, or they are victims of trafficking. So instead of us really looking at groups of migrants in these silos or groups of migration flows in these silos, we need to have an, a bit more wider view 
to understand that people are actually moving in a mixed migration flow. And one, one um, I would say one factor that really brings this together is, is, when, is when you see, when you've seen groups of people arriving. Uh, at borders. So you have 20, 30 people arriving. You have uh, the same border guard who maybe is only used to putting people in, you know, using immigration uh, uh, regulation in terms of managing migration. But in that space, you need to make sure that you have you have all the other um, categories of migrants taken care of so that you don't just have an immigration eye when you have these flows coming in, but you have a wider concept in understanding the flows that you have. So that means social workers have to be involved. That means international organizations, especially those that come in to support governments in ensuring international protection for, uh, for, 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 for migrants that need, and in particular here, refugees and asylum seekers are also present. So we are making sure that our borders are also ready in that case to receive mixed migration flows. And this is really helping us in that whole case management. Because if we look at it only in that particular silo, we may lose the vulnerability that other, these, these diff, the, the, the diverse groups that are, that are in this particular flow. I like how the Mixed Migration Center has put it, um, and I will be sharing some of these resources also in the classroom. Mixed Migration uh, Center says that the mixed migration refers to cross-border movements of people, including refugees fleeing from persecution, victims of trafficking, people seeking better lives. And the motivation is a multiplicity of factors. The people are in mixed flows, so they are, and they also have different legal status, and they also have different vulnerabilities. And it also, you know, it also uh, gives an example here to say that uh, in, in their particular case, uh, the mixed migration uh, nomenclature does not include uh, internally displaced person, but when they are doing their monitoring, so they are a center that provides a lot of data on mixed migration flows, they monitor and they track IDPs in the Horn of Africa region as part of a larger group that's displaced, therefore recognizing that IDPs are often tomorrow's migrants. So there's that interplay between the different categories, you know. So after having explained what the different definitions and, and categories are like, we really can see that a migrant can have this sort of, can have a, a very multiple, um, multiple identities, if you like, or there's an intersection of identities happening at the same time. And probably also happening over the lifetime of their migration cycle. So they could start as an internally displaced person. And as being, being an internally displaced person, they could graduate to being a force involuntary or, uh, you know, or, or otherwise, as the Mixed Migration Center has shown it. And therefore, we need an approach as scholars, as policymakers, as those of us looking to improve people's experience on this journey of migration, which we have agreed is, is, is essential uh, in, in, in for, for various reasons, in that it's, it's we're, we are really viewing at, looking at it with that kind of a, a, of a different, of, of one lens, but that has a, a bit more of an open mind. So I thought that's very important in us, you know, when we talk about characterizing it, that we're not really, you know, sometimes even though we're looking in the in the definition sense and in the in the real sense of uh, looking at the, the the different elements and the definitions and characteristics that we don't lose sight that we are seeing more and more mixed migration flows um, and that's happening everywhere across the world. Um, I don't think that there are borders that could predominantly say you know for us it's more students mobility and for us it's more. I mean that the flows are actually mixed even though people may not be arriving. Let's say the one flow you know the thirty people at one go but the kind of flows that are happening and the facilitation actually behind it also is important, particularly because we're looking at, when we're looking at irregular migration, that the facilitation, you know, of those um, that are moving, you know, that the refugees, so the refugees and asylum seekers, you know, they have a, they, they, they would know that I just need to run away from the conflict in front of me and get to the next border and declare my, uh, declare my need for help. But in terms of my movement, from where I am, they would join other groups or facilitators would join them together in other groups to facilitate this movement. So that angle is also very important in understanding uh, protection measures. Next up, um, I thought we could, you know, this we probably should, uh, very soon we'll be going for our next point. I think I will be uh, wrapping up shortly. The last slides were uh, basically more for our conversation. So with all these definitions and all these concepts, how important are they? And my question then is, how are they really assisting us in managing mixed migration and uh, migrants in vulnerable situations? Because we've identified that a lot of the flows 
uh, people who are arriving in mixed migration flows irregular in that sense, and they are in vulnerable situations. So I think it's much agreed you have different ways in which migration can uh, migration events can be defined. You know, you can look at the citizenship of somebody, you can look at the place of residence, you can look at the duration of stay or the nature of the movement, as we've discussed, uh, that We've also, you know, seen that migration can have different faces to it, and and therefore, you know, it we can't say that it's good or bad, and we can't say it's positive or negative, but that it really depends on the circumstances. Uh, I think we can also say that there is a common understanding, and when I say common understanding, maybe here I would relate it also to the highest level that we have in terms of legal frameworks or global frameworks, if we can call it that. When we looked at, for instance, the Global Compact for Migration and the Global Compact for Refugees, that you know, in addressing protection gaps in mixed migration situations, that maybe the definition is not so much important. Uh, and what's maybe important is the operational issue. You know, how are we really going to operate? So what tools are being provided uh, for states and, 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 you know, and territories to understand how to manage, you know, and how to address protection gaps in, in mixed migration flows. So not so much the definition, not so much saying this is a refugee or migrant, but looking at the operational issue. And I will come to it in a bit when I talk about gender and when I talk about children uh, as migrants. Um, and But the underlying principle I think that has been agreed is that migration should be safe, orderly and regular. Uh, I think it's also very commonly agreed by, by states, whether they've, you know, whichever kind of conventions they've signed up to, we all agree that we should, you know, do away with unsafe, disorderly and irregular migration. I think this is our ultimate goal um, and by, by us, it's all of us from scholars to, you know, practitioners to uh, policymakers, uh, that no one should be forced to leave their home country. And if it's necessary, they need to be given a safe and legal pathway for them to leave. And therefore, we have a kind of a definition of safe, orderly and regular migration, which is what we're aiming for, looking at the movement of persons, both in keeping the laws and regulations that govern exit, entry, return, stay in the states and in international territory in a manner in which there is human dignity and that the well-being of migrants is being upheld, their rights are being respected and protected, and that their risks which are associated with their movements are acknowledged but at the same time mitigated. Not that's just we acknowledge them, that we mitigate them. So there's this concept, I think that, uh, especially with the Global Compact for Migration, uh, no, especially with the 2030 agenda, or you know, the Sustainable Development Goals, that coins safe, orderly, and regular migration. So however we have defined it, however we have broken it down, uh, the fact that it should be safe, orderly, and regular. So technical definitions, yes, they're important. Concepts, yes, they're important. Categories, yes, they're important. And we can, you know, break it down, the geographical regions, temporal, political reasons. Uh, and, you know, but we, we, cannot, um, we cannot ignore the fact that however we distinctly put them, it's human beings at the end of the day, and we need to understand how to protect them. Here brings my next poll question. To understand, you know, having talked about different types of migration, which region are you from? And it also gives me a moment to have a sip of water. So just to make sure you're with me, because I've spoken for an hour, which is very long, just to check. Uh, can we bring up the poll, Dr. Sada? Yes, yes, yes. OK. So why are we trying to understand which region you're from? I think we've talked about how uh, migration is really can be, I mean, we, you know, can can come from different regions. but. Uh, this question that is, is not really in relation to that in trying to understand which region you are from vis-a-vis -vis migration. But I think it's to also understand the representation that we have in the room. So, you know, we saw that we have a lot of scholars, academics, students, um, <clears throat> CSOs are represented here, government is, uh, officials are represented here. But we want to know where you're from, you know, where you are, where you are sitting um, and where you are listening to us hear from and where you're going to engage with us in a minute. I think... How is it going? Or we can bring it up later. We can do two polls at the same time, Dr. Sada. I'll quickly move on. And then when you're ready, Dr. Sada, just let me know. Because you know, doing that, I think some technical issue. All uh, right. So I think we did, we did that one. Let's go to the next one. There's the next question. There's the next question, Feroz. I don't know if you've seen it. That points, uh, which region are you from? Uh, Attendees are viewing the questions. Have we, okay, you can go ahead and click your region. So there's Africa, Asia Pacific, Europe, and Middle East. Paris. 
yes that is sorry we we had to launch all questions all together no problem so all five questions are visible now for participants okay super okay so we have there which region are you from and i see asia pacific is in the race so we have a small race coming europe uh asia pacific asia pacific that's great and i can <laughs> see others are also even answering the other sides which is great um africa hello <laughs> nice to hear from the motherland <laughs> uh let's see i was hoping that we could at least get a 3% or so from middle east but that is uh that is interesting to see um that is good we have close to 100 people in the room uh, and only 25 have voted but it is also a saturday so people could be looking and listening on their mobile phones and yeah and the voting is proceeding and going on thank you very much i think for us this just gives us a better understanding of you know who is in the room with us when we do the when we do the the discussions that we have every saturday um like we said you know this unit is obviously looking at types and characteristics of migration but there's quite a number of other units that will be coming up um uh, and 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 uh, you know world renowned if i could even claim that myself uh, scholars and experts who will be coming to deliver uh, some very interesting lectures um on various topics so please look out for that so it's you know we want to know because it's good for us to see that we include as many um region specific examples so people can relate to the information that we're sharing we have almost reached 50% um of voters which is great and we can keep it running um i think we can keep it running in the background isn't it rakesh and you can feel free to vote in there but i just thought you know to remind those who haven't yet and then you know after talking about all this you know migration um elements in uh, you know safe orderly regular migration where is it really sitting you know and why is it so important you know if 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 um you know where can where can countries really look to to get this kind of inspiration uh, apart from their national um policies or you know regional mechanisms that they've come up to so as a cornerstone of of the migration component of 2030 agenda uh there is the 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 SDG target 10.7 which is particularly related to goten now maybe i start this way SDG 10 which uh and then we it has several goals and one of the goals is looks at reducing inequality within and among countries and as part of these goals there is an SDG target and particularly target 10.7 which speaks to states committing to facilitate orderly safe regular responsible migration and mobility of people including through the implementation of planned well managed migration policies so it gives it gives states this commitment but also provides an avenue in saying that i mean you cannot to to ensure that people are moving in in an orderly in a regular and in a safe way you would need to have policies in in place so it's not going to happen without with, without a vacuum uh, and i think that's that's been very that's been very well noted um so when we talk about this and i think other courses will touch a bit more on migration governance 10.7 then we say is the cornerstone um migration component and why because it really tries to bring everything together it's the most comprehensive in most aspects it's the most clear calling for action on migration but then we do have other targets right we have 8.8 um we also have 8.7 within uh, the sdgs 8.7 looks at you know uh, measures to eradicate forced labor um and uh, and you can see it uh, in the bottom there uh, you know eradicate forced labor and end and end uh, modern slavery uh, and eradicate also uh, human trafficking you have 8.8 which is up there next to 10.7 which talks about protecting labor rights and promoting safe and secure working um environments for all workers you know including migrant workers and it also actually specifically speaks about you know women in particular and we will come to that in a little bit 17.8 touches on you know building the capacity because remember they need planned and well managed policies how will they do this they need to build capacities of states to increase the availability of data 
extremely important and this is something that um, you can also refer to conversations we have had under the webinars GCM objective number one available on our YouTube channel uh, that really speaks to the importance of high quality timely and reliable data and even though this really corners on GCM um, but it really speaks to this particular uh, SDG target so you can see the relation between the SDG targets and the global compact for migration so that uh, documents at the at that at that high level are really uh, inspiring each other and are also not leading countries in all different types of directions in terms of where they should be getting their motivation and um, and 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 inspiration to to move on to the migration agenda so data extremely important because you know without data we don't know who to make safe we don't know who needs regular migration pathways we don't know who is moving in an, in an orderly in a, an orderly way um and and then we then we cannot pro promote safe migration at the, at the end of the day. So, um, so these really become, for the migration governance level, very important. And this information um, I, I was taking from the, you know, the UN, the UN DESA um, re migration report that they released in 2019, that really just tries to bring to you very clearly in one picture, which are the SDG targets that are related to migration. You have some on migration and development. I didn't touch on them because we will have something that particularly is related to that. Last thing to say on 5.2, um, talks about violence against women and girls, including trafficking, uh, sexual, and other, other types of exploitation. And also 16.2 really speaks particularly to end abuse, exploitation, and trafficking of all forms of violence against torture of children. And I, and I will tell you why um, I've transitioned to, 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 to picking on these ones, actually. Um, and here, we pause to reflect, what is and how will these states ensure that kind of migration? What are the planned and well migration policies? Big questions to ask, and I think this is this this really coins us to breaking down. Like we had said, we really need to break down our systems. We really really need to break down our structures to understand what we need. But we also need to understand who we are facilitating, who we are helping to make this kind of movement. So you know that that whole cooperation element becomes very important. The element of having data extremely important. The element of understanding the vulnerabilities of the people on the move extremely important. Uh, in understanding people, very important. Uh, I think I'll bring out two concepts here. One concept in terms of migration uh, that uh, has growing prominence, child migration. And I brought out, um, I think these are more for you to read, concepts that really uh, are very important when we talk about child migration. Now we know that, how do we describe migrant children? Because a lot of times you speak about child migration, for those who may not know, they may be having an image of a mother holding their child or a father holding the hand of their 10 year old. Migrant children is any any migrant who would be under the age of 18, regardless of their movement. Are they moving from rural to urban? Are they moving from one country to another? Are they crossing an international border? So as long as they are in that mode of movement for whatever kind of motivation and they fall under the age of 18, then they are a migrant child. And there's particular um, provisions that need to be followed. There are particular protections that are very essential for these children, as we had seen for other groups of migrants. Who is a separated migrant? A separated minor, rather, would be a child who is accompanied by an adult or relative other than the parent, but that person has some kind of legal custodian or, or customary primary caregiver. So sometimes, you know, as it is in, in many settings, in many cultural settings, you may not have the legal documentation that shows you that this is your, this is the, this child you should be taking care of, but that child has been handed to you following the death of an, of, of, of the, of the parent or following the, the departure of a parent to have gone somewhere. So that primary caregiver that has been assigned by the parent, informal and informal, uh, uh, and that's why here we have the legal or the customary one. Now, if that child has been separated even from that person, so the first separation they had was from their parent, and then the second separation they have is also from that caregiver, then we would say that this child is a separated minor. So they are accompanied by an adult other than their parent. So that's quite important to understand. So separated, other than your parent, you are a separated minor. So you're not traveling with your parent because if they're traveling with their parent, they would be considered into a family migration. So that would be a bit more different and the provisions also slightly different, but in some cases the same. 
unaccompanied minor, you're separated from both the relatives and the parents and the relatives, and no care at all, whether it's by agreement with the parents, by a legal document, that anybody is responsible for this child. Um, this is a phenomenon that we are seeing more and more in many parts of the world. After high school, all levels, or even before because of school dropouts, uh, due to the economic situation or just because they failed uh, that particular course, that young adolescents are taking the journey, leaving at 16, 15, leaving their homes to go and find a better livelihood. Whether they are leaving uh, due to the factors that are related to the migration factors, as, as I have said, they're living in, a, in mixed floors and highly likely that they are moving irregularly. So a lot of irregular movement of unaccompanied minors being found in the bulk of mixed migration flows. So this has been a very important phenomenon to come out because particular protection measures would be very important for these young adolescents who, and sometimes even younger children, who would have lost, you know, there's that loss of childhood. There's that loss of childhood because there's no care for this child. So we would also need to take care of that. And then there's also a child that has been detached from where they're coming from. Um, and here I will give you an example in one of the research that I was working on that looked at, you know, um, a migrant child that was, you know, three Iraqis coming in from, uh, sorry, um, uh, so you have three three gentlemen, let's say that 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 have come from the Middle East. Let's 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 put it as Middle East because I think this is, this is a clearer example. Coming in from the Middle East, find themselves first came in through South Sudan. From South Sudan, made the trip, however they did it, and find themselves sitting in Malawi. Now the question then comes, or sitting in Zimbabwe or in any other country, that child, they identify that actually this is a 16 year old. So that child then has to be separated from these adults, which is extremely important, particularly in cases where you have children moving as victims of trafficking. So you're separating them actually from the perpetrator, which could be a very big task for social workers and authorities. So separated, but remember while they're separated, those adults were the only ones who could understand the language that the child would speak. So even if you've taken them to the best and you've taken care of the best interests of the child, and that comes to the next point you will see in a moment, that child still feels vulnerable. They're very apprehensive. Uh, they're very scared. They cannot speak. Uh, they've gone through a very traumatic, but they also cannot communicate. So still very important that we understand the kind of vulnerabilities that they have. And even in the national measures, the well-planned migration policies that we take care of these. So in the so-called national referral mechanisms for dealing with migration flows, so whether we're looking at victims of trafficking, we need to have specific categories there that will look at unaccompanied minors. How are we really dealing with these unaccompanied minors? Because they have a lot of vulnerabilities with them. Um, some of them have been promised a lot of things. So how are we, how are we turning uh, how are we turning around to making sure that we are helping them and most importantly that we're not um, putting them in a situation that forces that gives them further harm case management is uh, you know like I've, I've just talked about national referral mechanisms national referral mechanisms that really look at this system in government this system between cross borders this system how is it going to handle cases so it looks at the planning, the implementation, the monitoring, the evaluation, the support process. You know, how are we addressing one case? Is there a minor here? Is it a group of siblings? Is it a whole family? So that whole aspect of case management uh, and case management obviously would apply even to, to other groups of, 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 of migrants. But like this case, this one is really taking care of the needs of, of, of children on the move uh, as an important concept. Best interests of the child. Here we're looking particularly, what is the right of the child? You know, what is the right of the child and how can we make sure that their best interests have been well assessed? How are we also making sure that it's, it's you know, that we can guarantee that it's implemented when a decision is taken? So is it important that we return this child immediately or is it important that we get them uh, settled first in a foster home before they are returned? Because it seems as though where they are coming from, it's not very clear whether they were a victim of trafficking. Um, this child needs has some has very specific needs right now where they've been intercepted as, as at the border. We cannot take them, lump them all together because we don't know who they are, and put them into immigration in detention. So even you know laws that call against detention of children. So the child is separated, taken to a social welfare center, provided for with the best needs. And this is where we're really taking the best, the best interest of the child. So we're really moving to the rights that they have, but also when the decision has been taken that's concerning the child, that his right is still remains guaranteed. So here brings in the concept of 
something that's a bit broader than child protection, which is called safeguarding. And safeguarding is saying, we want it to be bigger than child protection. You know, we want to make sure that the, you know, it's related to what are the actions that need to be taken to promote the welfare of this child and, and the so-called, you know, protecting them from further harm, because that is much bigger than just saying, I'm going to provide for you your basic needs, but to say, I'm going to promote a little bit of, you know, I, I'm going to, I'm going to bring out a little bit, you know, compensate a bit for, for that loss of childhood, for the trauma uh, that they have gone through being a child, which can be different to handle from when you're an adult to being a child. Very quickly, we move to feminization of labor, of migration, and feminization of migration, I think it's, it's, uh, it's, it's an important uh, concept. Uh, and I think it's very much related to how labor itself, first of all, has been feminized. So in internal migration flows, you can see, you know, Indian female workers, uh, female nurses and health professionals moving into urban areas. And we saw what that impact had on them in terms of, uh, the, the, you know, the COVID implications left behind women who have been in rural areas, you know, joining spouses and seeking work in urban areas, income generating activities, you know, they've opened up more for informal trade. So women are moving to get the better potential, you know, uh, uh, in urban areas for livelihoods. At the intra-regional level, uh, uh, you know, Filipino domestic workers moving to Malaysia, Singapore, Hong Kong. Um, and then here, I think I was trying to write something about, you know, serv service sector workers who are also moving more and more into the hospitality industry, um, but also into other levels of high-skilled migration where women are predominantly part of that workforce. International migration, we look at women moving for better opportunities also at um, as domestic workers. Um, and here, you know, here I was, you know, also looking at not just in the GCC context, for instance, but, you know, the GCC is attracting African, Asian um, migrants moving uh, as domestic workers, um, unfortunately, largely with a lot of different problems that are around the kafala system, for instance, in some parts. Farming uh, becomes has also has also become uh, quite predominantly important where, um, for instance, I was looking at an article where women in the Western Cape um, uh, and this is this is an article that came out from the Institute of Security Studies, where they were looking at women who are working in the Western Cape region and talking to one of the researchers said, you know, they work on, you know, grapes. And somehow, I guess, you know, women's hands are much more delicate in dealing with grapes than than, than men who would take other types of jobs. So there you see the demand of, 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 of women uh, in that kind of work in farming, but also for, di for many different uh, reasons. Health professionals is something that we've talked about, Filipinos to the US, African, Caribbean, Ireland, uh, Thailand, moving to the, to, to the UK. We can also have it where it's drivers related so women moving to reunite with their family with their with their husbands and their family members who have moved um Mozambique is one of those examples where men, predominantly men, left home to go and work in the mining towns in South Africa, and that has followed, been followed by a high wave of migration, whether it's women moving, women together with children moving, trying to reunite with this uh, father. Uh, and the same happens for Zimbabweans um, who have been in, 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 in South Africa. Um, and the same is also happening for Indian families uh, being reunited in GCC countries after long waves of migration. Um, forced migration, of of course, women and, and children highly impacted, and we can see the feminization there as well, where a lot of women and children uh, are forced to move and leave unsafe conditions um, and also facing different types of vulnerabilities. So these kind of concepts have also been very interesting to bring into and coin into migration. Then I will ask that you answer that uh, poll uh, three, where we're talking about, you know, after having spoken about, um, uh, you know, having spoken about um, migration and what you know what it encompasses um, zeroing in into mixed migration and also coming in on the concept of feminization child migration what would it be for you and I ask that you check the poll here I think if the poll can come up that would be great let me see can I okay the poll is there uh, uh, that's poll good is there. the poll is already there and I like that we're ahead of time so and the poll is this is, is basically asking us to think about who, you know, from and it's 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 you as an individual when you look at your national data for statistics on um, on on migration, who is your go-to source? You know, who is the one you would say this this one uh, provides that information? Is the and I can see from here we have wow, fifty-three percent relying on international organization as a source of national data. 
uh, on migration statistics, uh, followed by national organizations and regional organizations playing a role. That's good. Uh, no, actually followed by academic resources. That's good. We have a lot of work to do on the academic side. Uh, if we are, we are, we are, we are a reliable source of data, that's good to know. Uh, and civil society organizations as well. So good to see that I think we are really dealing with that different level um, uh, of, of sources of data and how important they are and how they interact in the space. I guess a lot, somebody must have had the question, but it depends on which data I'm looking for. It's mixed migration flows. Maybe I won't look into this particular database. So I will look at that particular database. So, uh, you know, it, it was a bit of a question that came out because uh, I asked myself actually that question, you know, I was going to put it as a slide, but I thought, you know, maybe we can have that interaction. So that's great. Thank you for your responses. And why did we talk about that? Um, you know, when we were just talking about the SDGs and how it's, and how it's important, one of the targets there was talking about uh, ensuring that we, pro we provide or that there is access and availability to migration data. Now, if you look at uh, that graph there is coming from UNDESA, and it comes from actually the IOM uh, GMDAC uh, website where it was really trying to look at migration uh, statistics. Um, and I branched off a little bit into this because I think that it's important for us to know that, you know, the sources of data can be internal, uh, you know, within the country, they can be, in, they can be international, they can also be related, for instance, you're looking at forced migration, so here you're very much specific on a particular sector, or you're looking at intra-regional migration data, so you probably maybe would lean more on your regional organization. Um, or your regional, uh, your, your regional cooperation mechanisms. Um, why is it important? It's important because we need to have data that's available because we need to understand that we need to record how people are moving. It's important to record how people are moving. And it's important also to record that disaggregated data is essential to keeping the policy informed of trends and the realities so that the policy really speaks to what's happening literally on the ground, how people are moving. Uh, the accuracy is absolutely necessary. And like we've talked about, you know, these different categories, you know, who are seasoned workers, who are not. And therefore I would say here that when you look at any kind of migration data source, you know, as long as it says migration data, it's always very important for us to look at the very small fine prints. What is this migration data actually measuring? And a lot of data statistics will have its de definitions given out because it's important for us when we're making the cross sectional comparisons so that if you have a graph like the one you have on the right which says international migrants at mid-year 2019 and we hear you know the numbers being flushed out and you know the number 272 is a number that's very uh, very well known because this is the number of you know the total number of estimated international migrants you know and we can then understand what that graph has meant and where that data has come from and how it is uh, and what it represents um very important also as you look at the geographical distribution you know we're able to see what that means in terms of who is sitting in europe who are these migrants who are in asia you know um and and the policies that will come uh, would need to be very specific, I guess, to those regions. And that's why regional data is very important because it also breaks down into another level of disaggregation when it comes to the regional level. And even at that regional level, we have those na national data that looks at the people actually moving on the ground what kind of vulnerabilities do they face across our borders, even if we're just a transit country? Because sometimes people would say, yeah, but they're just passing through, they're not staying here. But we have a responsibility as well as transit countries to understand the people passing through the borders and how we can be much more supportive you know, of these journeys, especially if we're looking at young children and adolescents joining these uh, these migration flows. Uh, and so instead of us just having an immigration approach to it, so it's a security, border security related approach, we would open our minds a little bit more. COVID, COVID has come and hit our world. I think we, you know, in some places they are saying they're 10 months in, some people are thinking they've been 11 months in, some people feel they've been locked down for a very long time. So it has impacted, uh, uh, different groups in different ways. I had put um, out there, but I think it's something I will share in the final version of this PPT, the list of different, um, you know, the different provisions that came out in, in looking at how COVID had affected different groups of migrants. Uh, and I thought that this is important to have this full list because I think it outlined, you know, very clearly which groups are affected. 
Uh, and when I say very clearly, it means that each of the policy briefs that came out, recommendations, uh, or whether it was sort of a joint group um, initiative that was bringing out clearly that what the impact has been, it's been very important, as we have said, in part of collecting data. We need to understand what really happened to people. You know, what, what has really been happening in their journeys on this migration? How have people who planned COVID came? How are they pursuing their journeys, especially those who are moving irregularly? What's really happening around that? Um, there's a group of migrants that were dumped by the tra by a trafficker um, and that, you know, when they arrived to Zimbabwe, they were going to cross over into South Africa. So Zimbabwe and South Africa separated by that border. And so they sort of realized we can't do we can't do anything with you guys. So they just dumped them there. The traffickers just left them there. Money has been paid, and most were coming from Horn of Africa. Money had been paid, and all was to be done is an international organization that comes in to try and see if you can help them go back home. And now here comes in the fact that if we're not really looking into the ground, if we're not picking all the data, it becomes difficult for us to understand the vulnerabilities and things that are happening. What's happening to smuggling and trafficking rings? How sophisticated are they coming and going against border closures and, uh, and lockdowns? You know, How are migrants who are already living in the country, how are they surviving? What about their documentation? Um, this is something that we haven't really talked about in terms of you know, types of migrants, but you know, in a way, somebody would say a regular migrant is a documented migrant, uh, an undocumented migrant, and you have this distinction between documented migrants and undocumented migrants as well. So basically, documented migrants will be those who have the legal stay in a country, whereas undocumented, no paper, no stay, and in some cases, children who are also stateless. They don't. They only probably have a birth record if they have it, no birth certificate, no recognition who this child is. And also understanding what's really happening to that child becomes very difficult. Who is this child? Who is taking care of their needs? Education, health. How do they access health services, especially in a COVID uh, uh, kind of situation? How do you access it? But also in terms of health crisis that could come, Ebola, for instance, in, 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 in parts of Africa, how did migrants who are undocumented, how did they access health services? How, how inclusive are these national policies? So that became very important. And so the poll, which was already up, and I will just see what the results um we're saying, the poll was really trying to look at and asking you to say, who do you think of these different groups of migrants? And there, I, I just picked a small selection, would be most affected uh, by the impact of COVID and it's still happening. So 61% uh, in this room here of, of the 99 people who are here are saying that labor migrants. And yes, um, I think all sections are very valid in their answer. Student mobility, most definitely for some students who are, you know, still on holiday or at home, uh, locked out of their learning institutions. If they have uh, international, if, if they have uh, provisions to webinars and, and internet and all these things, maybe they continue with some more uh, remote learning, but that presence in the classroom misses out interaction with their peers and students has, has a new definition to it. Family settlement, yes, indeed, borders are closed and, uh, a lot of border uh, officers um, and national jurisdictions were not really looking at family reunification as being the most important thing. They were looking at their nationals returning home and also trying to control with social distancing. How do you really bring this together? You know, so allowing really pockets of people arriving in some parts of uh, of Asia, you needed a special permission not just to leave the country that you are living in as a migrant. So if I'm a migrant in Malaysia, I need permission to leave the country so that I can re-enter when I come back. Um, and it was only given on special provisions. Those who were stuck outside needed to somehow justify their linkage to Malaysia. Even if you've lived there 10 years, it doesn't matter. You are more linked to South Africa where you are stuck because of COVID than Malaysia where you have your home, you've paid your rent, you have your job. So all these kind of provisions that are there, but it's governments trying to understand how they can control this COVID, but how do we find that balance? Uh, labor migration, which has been you know, put out here. Yes, a lot of people will be impacted, loss of jobs, loss of livelihoods, especially even those who are working in the informal sector, and also a large part of them are, are, are labor migrants. Uh, how are they really impacted? Uh, some have also been wages haven't been unpaid because they are on, an, they are on you know, 
it's basically pay as you work uh, for a lot of people. So what would that mean in terms of livelihood? Not just for them where they are living. Uh, some have had to share accommodation with people because they are not in their homes. So they have not bought homes or don't have enough money to build homes. Uh, so they are shared living, exposing them more to COVID. So indeed you would say labor migrants have a, a lot of vulnerabilities that are attached to them that you could, you know, uh, take a whole webinar to to explain. Um, and then, of course, the impact on the livelihoods that you have just, you know, extends this kind of vulnerability also to their families who are depending not just on their remittances, but on the fact that my father, who's working in the Gulf, is of sound mind and he's happy where he is doing his job uh, and, and he's, that he's well provided for. So there's, you know, there are all, there are all those Forced, forced migration, most definitely, I think we cannot ignore the fact that, you know, uh, uh, even though there were, bit, there were some quiet months and, and the climate seems, you know, the, the environment seemed to have been happy in some areas to have adjusted to less people moving in, in some places, uh, you know, I mean, climate change is still moving. I think, you know, experts in climate change, and I'm not one, are showing that we need to take the action and the action is now. So, you know, we can see that some places will disappear, some <clears throat> Some people will lose their homes and their livelihoods. We can see uh, locusts, for instance, they spread all over Africa. Nobody really understands, or maybe I just don't understand uh, where these locusts came from with different strategies like, you know, ducks can eat locusts, but so many ducks can eat so many locusts and you're wondering, it's, it's such a big problem, but they're taking away crops. They are taking away, so food security related uh, migration, you know, migrants who will move because they, they cannot, uh, you know, their crops have been eaten. Um, <clears throat> environmental disasters, obviously. Um, I think just recently we have heard of, of, of uh, off the coast of Mozambique, how migrants have just been forced out, uh, you know, of areas where they were calling home. So definitely an impact. So. I think with this, we can say a lot of room to investigate, to read out on the different data sources, but also to understand what, um, you know, this could be interesting research question for those who are looking uh, at picking one of these, uh, picking such a topic uh, uh, and really bringing it also, I think very particularly to a micro level, because we have a lot of macro information, information that's there on the wider scale. Uh, and I think we need more work that's done on the micro level because that level of information is very important to address uh, and provide protection. Okay, that was the poll. Uh, I think I have gone over my time because I really wanted us to have half an hour to discuss um, vulnerabilities. I think I will not even go more into it because we've talked about it as we were going, you know, um, those are just newspaper, art, news, news articles um, that I think I've even shared before in other form, um, which talk about some of the vulnerabilities that come out of, you know, uh, making the move and leaving your home, whether it's temporal or permanent. Uh, how people move, um, whether it's internal, as you can see on that picture there, um, whether people have moved for, the next picture there talks about xenophobic violence among non-nationals in South Africa and how people feel that their lives are being robbed. Um, and then you see IOM doing returns uh, of migrants uh, returning there. Um, after being stranded, they were probably, I think they were there, they were in Niger, that picture taken from Niger, they were stranded for six months uh, due, to, due to COVID uh, and they are from Sierra Leone. So they were returning from Niger where they had been in transit. So that's, that was not even their destination. They were in transit on their way to try and make their way to the coast of Libya to cross over. Um, yeah, and uh, yeah, so you can see what the impact has been so, I mean, we can do better, definitely. Uh, and even though there it says international migration, I think what I meant to say is international cooperation. We can do better, but I think the word migration was resounding in my mind. We can definitely do better. Um, we can see how people feel that, you know, the article there from the Mixed Migration Center, um, and it came from, you know, looking at abuse, protection and justice among the roots. Uh, there's a picture there coming out of Lebanon, I think it was, where migrants were stuck outside a, an embassy. Uh, there's a picture there of a young lady who has been living, you know, for months in, um, where was this? I think it's also in uh, in Lebanon um, and living in very difficult conditions, trying to support her family, having lost her job uh, and being paid um, peanuts, really, for a wage. Um, and yeah, and you know, what, sh what do we want to see in terms of migration when we talk about this regular safe? Uh, we want to hear stories of, you know, uh, young, young, old uh, women, men, children, 
who migrate safely uh, and who can make contributions. I've put a picture there of a of a Somali born um, migrant uh, who, who is now in the United States and is a UNICEF uh, ambassador. Her name is Halima Adam and she she works on, on, on sort of, you know, standing up for migrant children. Uh, there's an article there, uh, which I think is one of my favorite articles when I talk, when people try to, to, to say, you know, migration is not possible. And then I say, uh, you know, eight foreign players in Switzerland uh, national team uh, where, you know, it, it, they were coming from Tunisia, Sen you know, and, and that's this, in Tunisia and Senegal and Morocco, you had you had multiple nationalities joining these uh, these uh, these teams, you know, for football. So how that is a unifying factor, uh, and you know, and you can see that you know migrants don't just come from African origin, but even in the Balkans, a lot of the the players in the in the in the European uh, 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 clubs uh, are coming also from the Balkans, and and what that has meant in terms of football uh, is something that generates uh, a lot of money uh, for for for. Um, for football and in the industry. So on that note, I think I uh, it's a positive note. I would say, who is a migrant? Or I think the question actually should have been, are you a migrant, you know? Do you consider yourself a migrant? And the question was, yes, no, I don't know. And I'm happy to see that, you know, 50%, and I would add 50, maybe I don't know, can I say 51.9 of us in here consider, because I consider myself a migrant, because I have moved from my usual place of residence, uh, and my journey continues. Um, and, uh, and yeah, and hoping that, you know, more and more people can make safe, regular, and orderly journeys um, to what they will call their new homes for however long they will be. So maybe we take a two minute break and then I will open up and we can have questions. Thank you. I think that will be fine. So we have a few questions also in the chat room. Oh, yes. We can ask them directly to ask you. Yes. So let me go to the chat. I think I have to end. Stop share. All right. Um, oh. okay. So I would just ask uh, Khadija Timanuel to prepare yourself. Um, to ask the question, I think I see also a question from Ananda Maju, uh, Majumda. Um, uh, okay, I see from Subir as well. Thank you. So if you could just prepare yourself to ask the question. Uh, have I missed anybody? Uh, okay, then there's a practical question about around the, the courses that we have. Uh, oh, then I think I didn't explain well the poll, so I have beautiful uh, illustrations there and answers that come. And then uh, the difference between migration. Okay. All right, so. Maybe after one minute, we can open.
Okay. You ready? I think they can ask directly. Yeah, maybe they ask, or otherwise I, let me see. Can no, you make them co-host? No. I can unmute them whenever. Like, okay. All right. Dr. Raj Bordhan also has a question. I think. Yes. Okay, so maybe we start with Dr. Raj, because I mentioned their names, but I'm not sure. Dr. Dr. Raj can unmute herself. All right. Dr. Raj, all right. So maybe I, okay. Oh, sorry. Yes. Yes, yes. Okay, all right. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, so, Paddy, thanks very much for such a comprehensive presentation. You have touched many, 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 many issues and areas and uh, gaps and so on and so forth. I, I just want to say two things. One, uh, so that because there's so much to digest, there's a lot. Yeah. And those of us who are familiar with these things, it's okay. We can dissect and put away certain and focus on certain other areas. But for some who are not familiar with this area, even though you have summarized it very well, I think I just want to flag two, two things. One, mobility and migration. Although all migration involves mobility, but mobility is not, uh, uh, does not equal migration, in other words. So, one has to move to then move to wherever permanently or semi-permanently you want to settle. Okay, that's one. Mm -hmm. So, and this, the other thing that I like very much was the interplay between different categories of migrants. How does one sift? How does one become this category then with that category with the intent of the eventual mm -hmm. category? You understand, in other words, people follow creative pathways to reach their goal of finally migrating and settling. They may come, go as mm -hmm. a student, they may go as a, uh, an internal uh, migrant, or they might go as regional migrant, and eventually, mm -hmm. over a period of time, they want to end up where they want to. So I think mm -hmm. it's, it's like various paths that people are following. Mm -hmm. It's actually two words, that eventual goal of Migration for most, I'm not saying for all, for most. <laughs> so any policy then has to be cognizant of the fact that within our genes as humans, our thing is we need to move to something which is better than what we are, uh, find ourselves in. So that's one. Two, as regards data, while data collection is very important, I think we need to bear in mind the limitations and the capacity of <laughs> Uh, data collectors. At the macro level, you know, the migration people, they have some data, whether they pass this data on to statistical office, who analyzes, who publishes, who makes it public and so on. So I think it's important that data in itself, collected in itself, is of no value if it's not analyzed uh, yes. and, and, and not shared uh, for policy making and so on. What's the interplay we have to see? I know I was not able to take part in all these uh, polls because they were going so fast. So what's the interplay between, what's the, what's the interplay between uh, uh, migration data collection agencies, which is the immigration, the border, mm -hmm. and, and then where does it end up and how does that inform uh, so these might be very macro level data mm -hmm. and micro level data because the things changes. People are moving their status from uh, uh, temporary to maybe another region, maybe to another country, maybe. So it's, it's a very fluid situation. So the question is now, how can a reliable set of data, which will have to be uh, updated all the time and in this day of computer and so on, how is it possible then who can help? How can the IT help to generate, to share and to plug in any changes? So what, what will be, what sort of the nodes will be playing at the same time, you see, for the data migration data to make any sense? So I'll stop here to allow others. Uh, uh, so thanks very much. Thank you, Dr. Raj. I think um, your last point, very important. And, in and, terms and by the way, you're look, you're looking smashing. I'm just looking at you now. <laughs> I got up. 
late. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Raj. <laughs> Missed miss the first presentation. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. The interplay uh, with data. I think you are right. Our problem is not that we don't collect data. Our problem is that the data doesn't, doesn't speak to each other. So home affairs collects data. Um, social services will collect data. Uh, UNHCR will collect data that's related to refugees and asylum seekers. Uh, another department um, in the police that looks at, you know, uh, victims of, um, let's say, uh, immigration, uh, immigration uh, related detention collects data. So this data is not really speaking to each other. And I think this is the way we need to find it. And, and I think that sometimes the way has been to understand what we want to use the data for. So if the data is used for us to be able to address the vulnerabilities that the migrant group is in question, then that becomes much more easier for us to be very intentional with our data. But if we're just collecting data for the sake of, this is where we end up with data sort of sitting like you say on shelves and that doesn't really speak to each other. So I think there's an issue of what we want to use data for and we're using data for policymaking, we're using data to inform our procedures and our practices uh, at the national level, at the regional level as well. And I think regional mechanisms have been a way to push countries. Um, uh, here I'm thinking also about, for instance, in Southern Africa, where you have had, uh, you know, whether it's it's the regional economic community around um, around SADC, or you look at what I call the SADC plus, so that means that it, it's including also other countries that are still important for migration, but are not part of SADC. And what that means in terms of collecting data, because migrants are moving into these territories. And what does that sort of mean um, at the same time. And so the data is going from the countries of origin, the countries of transit, also for the countries of destination. And if this data could sort of speak um, across, that would be quite interesting. But of course, collection of data also at the micro level becomes important because that's the granularity of the issue. This is where we see what is the specific issues that have to do with children, specific issues that have to do with a particular gender the specific issues that have to do with the particular flow of migration um, and then how that is interacting in the, in, the, in, the, in the context of mixed migration flows. That I think remains still very important. So, so I think that it, it, the intersection comes in the way, what do we want to use it for? And they, we want to use it for to inform decisions. And therefore, if this is what we want, we need various agencies. The use of technology, definitely very interesting. But sometimes I find that, um, especially in, in, you know, in countries where data systems are even already not talking to each other, people want to use blockchain, blockchain technologies before they can just sit each, across each other and say, hey, am I able to share data with you? And we're already talking AI, you know, uh, artificial intelligence. We're already talking blockchain. But I think we still need to deal with the small um, parts in our legislation that allow us to be able to share data. And sometimes it could some be something uh, like, for instance, looking at victims of trafficking and how that could support, you know, how what kind of identification um, methods are going from one place to another. For, in investigation, sometimes some countries are not able to share across the information. And that means that that case for, that, for those particular victims of trafficking remains stored because of the fact that officers cannot sit across the same table. In, in the European context, you know, you have, um, you have outfits that that are out there that are sitting and have even arranged, you know, Europol, for instance, sits and has said for this particular cross-learning, um, cross-learning experiences in, in, is, is, is important. Joint operations are important, but certain types of um, agreements had to be made even with third countries, you know, so that they can understand how to deal with, um, with particular cases and to cooperate. So data has a very important place to play. Uh, and sometimes it's sitting, you know, the, 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 the knots are sitting in our, 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 um, our, let's say our legal policies that don't allow us to share the data. And sometimes it's just a matter of us sitting across and saying, what do you need from me? And what do I need from you? And then putting that together in the context of, you know, and, and technology is there to help us as best as we want. Multiple identities in terms of, um, of migration, also very important. And of course, you know, when we collect the data, we see the people, we see the different things that they have. I'm a woman who is an I, who was an IDP, now I'm going to move uh, because of the place, the place where we were, uh, you know, settling there because there was a climate, um, so internal, internally displaced person, and all of a sudden a war breaks out, there's conflict. Uh, so then I have to cross to another country. Uh, and then maybe I can seek asylum in the other place because there are provisions that allow me to seek that. So this thing of being a multiple, one identity uh, as a migrant also becomes very difficult um, and, and, and difficult to process in terms of vulnerabilities. I mean, 
for instance, if I have a multiple identity, it also means that I have multiple vulnerabilities. I could face racism, I could face xenophobia uh, attacks, I could face also the fact that I'm, I'm, uh, I'm a woman, I could have different vulnerabilities of, or I'm a child, I'm also susceptible to people abusing me or giving me work that, uh, that gives me a low wage or no wage at all because I'm under the minimum age. So those kind of vulnerabilities, are, uh, ex you are exposed to that, you're exposed to those potential risks. So the point is also that you need to identify those multiple identities because that's the only way you're going to provide the right protection and safeguard the interests of the child. So I think that's important. I think in saying that, um, I can see that uh, there were some different questions that were that were asked, and I think I will start from the bottom going up. Uh, what could be done to protect uh, consular assistance to migrants who are abroad? Um, I would point you without, not because I'm being lazy, <laughs> but because I think that there was a very interesting discussion that we have had last Tuesday that is particularly on this topic, which was, you know, looking at GCM, uh, Global Compact for Migration, objective number 14, which speaks to countries providing consular assistance to migrants throughout the migration journey. So here you really do see the linkage between the fact that I've left my country, doesn't mean my country of origin, you know, passing through its system. It's only interested uh, in the good that I have to bring uh, to the country. But when I am in trouble, uh, I cannot reach out to my embassy. I cannot reach out to my government. So I think this webinar really covered quite comprehensively on what can be done in terms of consular assistance, especially in the context of crisis. And in, in this particular case, we do have multiple crises, crises that have followed on, you know, and are piggybacking on on the ride of COVID. You know, it's like COVID came in as a train and it's brought so many different crises. But, you know, consular protection, of course, working with other parts of its um, of its community, the host government, the governments back home, working with diaspora communities that they have, uh, and also working sometimes even with private sector, are able to provide to uh, assistance to migrants abroad. Um, there was also a question that was looking at the difference between migration and displacement uh, and how those concepts are related to, to, to development. And I think here I will say that uh, there will be a particular unit that looks uh, that that will look to migration and development. So I think you should watch out for that one because I think it it will really uh, break it down much more than I can do in a minute uh, of the time that we have. Um, migration and displacement. I think Dr. Raj also touched on it. You know, uh, with displacement, I am being forced. Uh, you know, to move. Uh, so I'm being displaced. Whereas with migration, there could also be a per. A, a, it all falls under migration. But the point is that. With, with a general form of migration, there's, there's different pockets like we have explained who are making some kind of movement. So I think that it's the push factor to move that makes displacement very difficult. If there was no conflict, if there was no environmental disaster, if there was no um, climate change related uh, um, uh, push, I would stay where I am and therefore not be displaced in this case. Uh, I don't know if I could, should I call up somebody or I just continue answering them? Um, then Tampi had uh, also asked, uh, you know, talking about uh, uh, came to Africa even without passports to loot and still we're we are having the best resources. The only thing we forgot about the traditional management. Okay, yeah, I think Tampi here, <clears throat> point taken in us, you know, <clears throat> being cognizant, I think, of history. And I think Dr. Rad's uh, webinar was very good in, into taking us what the history, uh, what the history of migration has been like uh, and, you know, and where we have gotten from. And, you know, and I think also talking about migration and development, I think will be will be one of those important uh, places. Sorry, I'm trying to move my screen at the same time if you see me looking up. Uh, so I think you know, uh, and, you know, you, you go on to say that with, uh, if I'm, I don't think I'm paraphrasing, with love and respect, with trust within a couple of years, Africa and Asia can be the best place to migrate. I agree with you. And I think that is where we can really say that um, intra-regional migration has really played a push in the last couple of years. We are saying, let's not look for answers in what people call the global north, or I would say Western countries or more advanced nations or countries that are, you know, are, are richer in income. 
um, and, and, and in overall wealth. But we can also look at countries that are least developed and see how we can complement each other. I think there is this whole concept of South to South migration, which is which still remains very important. And it's something that we can look at in terms of, of also how migration can impact on development, uh, regardless of where it's coming from. Um, I think there were also some questions. Uh, Subir Rana had asked a question on elaborating a bit further on climate change and its links with human trafficking in different parts of the world. Yes, various research that has been done uh, on this. Actually, I was reading a piece uh, that particularly looks at climate change and human trafficking. But I, I mean, I also have to say that I think that a lot of climate change, climate change um, impacted refugees, if there's anything like that, or refugees, um, I shouldn't say refugees, I should say migrants that are moving uh, due to the fact of, of, of climate change are joining mixed migration movements. So they are just moving and looking for livelihood and who can who best can help you. If, if you have moved from one part of your country to another because of a climate change related impact um, and your government doesn't provide for your basic needs, doesn't provide, but you do know that just in the neighboring country, there is work. Uh, I think there are many of us on this webinar who are more likely to join anybody who can facilitate you to get food on your table, regardless of whether that's a legal job or illegal job uh, uh, because you know human instinct is for people wanting to survive and they will try as Dr. Raj had said creative pathways so I think um, that's that's important. Uh, another thing to say uh, Ananda had asked the question about the ultimate objective of the characteristics of migration uh, and you were saying people migrate through various ways for what similar reasons um, I'm not sure I quite understand your question, but if your question is asking what's the ultimate objective of migration, I would say the simple answer would be to say to improve my livelihood, to improve my situation. Um, and whatever that situation is, if the situation is related to not having enough wedges, not having enough food, um, my situation is related to not having to hear uh, violence around me, uh, not having to fear for my life because of political uh, turmoil, uh, or because I have religious, different religious um, beliefs from uh, the neighbors. Um, people move because they are uncomfortable. I think this is, you know, in, 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 in another way, I would say they're uncomfortable, but they know that they know or they think that on the other side, I can get this. And, you know, speaking about speaking about this and, and you know, and, 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 and facilitation, you know, one thing we also find out with trafficking and smuggling or rather facilitation in general for migration is that sometimes it's actually happening, not because the trafficker is showing up with, you know, a big suit which calls, is called trafficker. Uh, or or, the, or the, the network, you know, this sort of network that we think can be very sophisticated. And I think the sophistication comes in the, that it can be very familiar. Young girl whose mother uh, is good friends with the neighbor. The neighbor says, uh, there's a man who's looking for a young for for somebody to marry. You know, he's very wealthy. He's been in South Africa for the last 10 years. He can give your daughter a very good. And I know him, you know, he comes from that village and so on. You should send her. And the parents concede to this, not really knowing that the girl arrives and finds herself in very harsh conditions. So there's still an exploitative nature there. But look at that Look at, look at the sophistication that is in there. Maybe the, the mother to the friend doesn't even know that it's traffickers who are, who are involved in this kind of a network. Um, and then on the other side, you know, uh, that they are exploited. Uh, and, and you hear many, many stories of people being returned or intercepted or being found or rescued um, who are in this kind of situation. So there's a lot of sophistication that goes in, into people wanting to make this move to improve their livelihoods. If it's not for my generation, maybe for my children or my children's children. Uh, uh, you know, f I heard of stories where the, at, 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 at borders where children are left at the church, you know, a mother leaves small child at the church because they know that maybe somebody would take care of, of, of that child and at, at, at that border, you know, at, they've entered irregularly and they know that the children's needs cannot be provided. So leave the child, I become irregular somewhere else, but maybe this, this, this citizen uh, who will take care of this child can give them a better education. I don't think that's a very easy uh, decision to make uh, as a mother myself to have to leave my child. But if you're thinking that I cannot provide what this child could have with another family, maybe that's what you 
find as an alternative. So the objectives, I think, are very um, difficult to, to outline in a, in a long list, and they are existing at really various levels in terms of what is really the objective of, of these characteristics that we see in migration trends. Um, then, uh, okay, just to say, Dr. Tulika, uh, we have, we will then show, I think, at the end of this webinar, um, I think you were asking for the attendance sheet. Sorry, I thought you were asking for uh, the sessions that are upcoming, but we will share that, and I'm sure the attendance sheet, I think, has already been shared. Um, so for those who would like to join future uh, conversations, you would need, or future lectures, sorry, you would need to just see uh, and follow GRFDT um, uh, as well uh, to see what the special lecture topics would be on. I think I've already explained, and I tried to be uh, Khadija Emanuel, the difference between interregional uh, in, uh, in, interregional migration and international migration. Well, you would say interregional in, in the fact that it's if it's interregional, then I think it is international, um, because you'd be moving. I guess in this case, you're talking about moving from one region one region to another. Uh, so let's say, for instance, in the in the, the you know we're calling the Asia Pacific as one region, uh, but you know if I'm moving from one end to another, if I'm moving you know in in the, in the Pacific itself, if I'm moving from from and crossing an international border, then I would call that uh, international migration. Uh, in that case, because you are you are you are really crossing, you're going across regions, uh, and the same would be if I'm moving, for instance, from Africa into Europe, that then is international because there is a boundary, there's a continental boundary and the continent being or the region in, in your description would be Africa and Europe. Those would be the two regions and the movement of the migrant would be international because they are crossing an international border. Um, but like I said, you know, intra-regional, transnational, these words are played around uh, a lot. And I think it's really about context. And that's why it's always very important, even in the data, that we look to what this speaks to. Uh, I think there have been, there've been other questions that have been asked. Um, yeah, I think I have answered all the questions, unless there is somebody else who wants to put their hand up, but I think we need to close pretty soon. So I see a new question here that came. I was asking a similar ambition. Okay. Um, is there any important characteristic, which is marriage migration? Interesting, marriage migration. Thank you, Naweed, for that, that question. Yes, marriage migration. And I think marriage migration, then I would put it, I mean, difficult to put it under the component of family migration. Uh, but basically, this is the movement that you make because one partner in this relationship or in this marriage uh, would be uh, based, would be, it's, 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 it is moving for the purposes of joining. So I think it sits in family reunification. Um, but yes, like I said, you know, like with all the, all the, all the different categories on, on, on migration and, and the characteristics of migration and the trends, uh, they can be subject to, to really looking at them a bit differently. Um, when people have talked about marriage migration, there's also a lot of different type of facilitation that goes in marriage migration. So when we, <clears throat> and, and I think in other places we have seen this uh, more that you actually have these marriage agents. So marriage agents that are helping to uh, move uh, one, <clears throat> one spouse in the, that particular marriage relationship from one country to another for the purposes of joining or, or, or starting a new life in that particular marriage. Um, there are a lot of studies I think that have been done about this uh, and some of them that really also point to problems around regular migration uh, that is related to family reunification and marriage, um, a marriage, marriage migration being an important part of it. Um, some visa uh, and legal pathways really not being uh, accommodative of or of and, and also immigration policies that are really not accommod uh, accommodative of families reuniting. And this is happening in advanced countries, even as, as, as far as you talk of Denmark, uh, where it's not very open and very easy for one spouse to move. There's a lot of red tape and provisions that have been given. And I think this is largely di driven by the political situations of these countries uh, and also other considerations that countries may have. There are some that take you through a transition way, like in the US, you start with this sort of fiance visa that 
migrates into something else and others moving and categories that are that are there that try to see what the actual situation on the ground would be. Uh, and then there are also new forms of marriages accepted in one jurisdiction, but not accepted in another. I think that's also an interesting thing that can come out of it. In terms of irregularity of practices around marriage migration, I think a lot has been seen also in how, um, you know, marriage, uh, you know, uh, in, in regions where there have been less women. Uh, and here, you know, I'm reminded of, of cases, uh, uh, for instance, looking at China, where, you know, essentially villages have depleted, there are no women in those, there are hardly any women in, in those communities uh, that men can marry. Uh, and therefore, you know, girls, uh, young girls and women are, bring, are being brought from Southeast Asian countries, like uh, Nawid has just also pointed out here, um, and they're being essentially trafficked um, into, into these villages uh, for promise of a better life. You're going to get married to a man, he's wealthy, uh, and this is the life that you will have. So there's deception involved. Uh, and then at the end of the line, there's also um, uh, exploitation. So a lot of vulnerabilities that they're met with, but this is also not just common there. It's also common in, in, in many different parts where uh, people are being moved uh, because they are coming from the same cultures or similarly same cultures. So it allows them uh, to, 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 to have this facade to bring in uh, young girls and exploit them in the name of marriage migration, which, which sometimes doesn't end very well and is not the marriage that this lady was looking for. So in that, instant, in that is instance, this would fall under human trafficking. Uh, very complex to deal because uh, in a lot of cases, sometimes in some cases, it has involved children being born out of this. And then what really happens to these children when those marriages have to be dissolved? Um, and what kind of protection measures still can happen, you know, um, uh, you know, for, 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 for people in this situation. So yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Nawit, for that, uh, for that comment. I, I think we are- Oh, yes. Now, sorry, I had the chat open. So I was now going to come and say, can I ask, I was actually going to ask you, Professor Bart, to say something. You need to unmute yourself. Uh, he can't unmute himself, I think. Professor Bart? I can't. Uh, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I, I can be. Yeah, it's, uh, I think I can't resist but uh, repeating what Raj mentioned. You look smashing. <laughs> Thank you, sir. And secondly, it's an encyclopedic presentation brilliantly brought out, absolutely. I think there's nothing more I could think in terms of thinking about migration. What? Uh, we are in the COVID condition and that has thrown up one more idea to think, uh, you know, maybe to ponder over is uh, e-migration immigrant. Mm -hmm. I'm here in Hyderabad, okay? But I work in, uh, um, in Fremont in, in California. My job is that. And I go log in at the time when it's uh, office there and I'm at home here. I need not go there maybe for years. This is what's going to happen in course of time. I think it's going to be the new norm going to come up. This is one part. The other is, uh, you know, I can be a citizen of the US. Mm -hmm. It's a dual citizenship available mm -hmm. today. So when I cross from India to US, I'm not crossing the international boundaries. You know, if I cross, mm -hmm. I'm there as well as I'm here. My place is both in uh, the other location as well as in my location where I'm uh, national. Mm -hmm. So it's not international, but I nevertheless cross international boundaries. Mm -hmm. So I, these are the two points. I think you have uh, gone non-stop for two and a half hours, and I don't think I would expect you to answer, but this is some small point you could ponder over. Uh, in, in a, uh, we will have occasions to discuss too. Yes, I, I think a very interesting one, and I had sort of thought about it in talking about e-residence, uh, because you are right that with uh, you know even just prior to the to the pandemic you've had situations where some countries were actually even offering i think there's a country um 
I was trying to remember it as I as, as you were speaking, that would offer e-residence, you know. So basically that I'm considered a resident of that country, even though I have not moved there. And and it could be interesting for different kinds of uh, people who are motivated to move uh, electronically <laughs> in this case. But yeah, and I think you've given a, a very a very good example of what that is. And I think the use of technology there in being very innovative. And I wonder where that is going to take us uh, in the future, looking at how we have been immobile, if you like, um, and also how we've not been yeah. able to migrate yeah. for those of us who even thought we would be able to migrate to, to places where we, would, where we were looking to change our place of where we're living, our usual place of residence would become another place, but we still continue to do the work from that new space. Um, so how am I really, you know, considering myself? And I think uh, it's an interesting point, especially for um, for tax authorities, for instance, to understand that and for people who also feel that they are being really um, being torn apart by tax systems, you know? So where should I pay my taxes? You know, I'm paid in this way. And so I think it's interesting questions that are coming in and governments I think would like to understand that a bit better because obviously, you know, we know governments uh, and taxes, the, the more they keep uh, in their coffers, the more they have. So a very interesting uh, sort of public sector migration related concept uh, to talk about in terms of e-migration um, and e-residence. Yeah. Thank, well. thank, thank you very much. much. It looks wonderful. It has been marvelous, really. The, the thank you very much. Thank you. So I think we don't have any more questions or we cannot also because already two and a half hours. Yeah. So thank you, thank you for uh, covering so many things, and it is a right. Again, I like Professor Bot mentioned, it, you co you covered everything almost. So it's a very very it's a very comprehensive talk, and uh, maybe we can entertain questions through email if anybody has, and uh, we we'll look forward to any further interaction through email. So thank you, Paddy, and thank you all the participants. And uh, keep coming. Next talk again we'll have uh, by some professor um, Bhagat. So please come in. every Saturday. We should attend, and I think the number is decreasing. We need more participation. So please be regular, and uh, that will encourage us. And through your participation only, we can make this program very successful. Thank you all. Thank you, Sada. It has been marvelous. Thank, Thank you, Dr. You. Sada. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for the team behind. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Sir, you have to close. So, sir. Firoz. Rakesh, can I close? I don't think I can close. I think I can only leave. Huh? Only Firoz can close. All right. Thanks, Rakesh. Thank you. Thank you, Paddy. Take care. It went extremely well. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.